Hi, I'm Jason Charles Miller, and welcome to a new edition of Starter Kit. This time around, we're returning to Dungeons & Dragons to explore the game a little more deeply through an urban adventure with fifth-level characters. The first thing we had to do was create those characters, so we brought our players together with our dungeon master for this adventure, David Nett, and we turned those concepts into full-blown Dungeons & Dragons characters. Good to see you. Good to see you too. All right, let's sit down and make a character. Yes, let's do it. All right. And let's level a character up. Yes, exactly. So because you already made a first level character, right? I did. So let's, uh, let's grab that right away and just stick that right in front <gasps> there of you. There she is. There she is. So you made your first level character in D and D Beyond, right? So D and D's yes. online tool mm -hmm. helps you do it. Uh, I took some of what you did and I wrote it down in pencil on the sheet because we're going to level her up yes. manually cool. the way that yeah. God intended. So, <laughs> no, uh, because, so we need to erase Because we're things. teaching the game and so we're going to yeah, teach totally. you what to do stuff here. So D&D okay. &D Beyond is a wonderful tool, but we're going to do it live here. So let's we'll uh, do it live. <laughs> let's talk to me a little bit about a Raviel. So okay, uh, I chose a a wood elf. Uh, a Raviel. She she's a wood elf uh, warlock, mm -hmm. and warlock is actually my favorite class. Oh wow! In Dungeons and Dragons. Okay. And the main reason is because it has a built-in backstory with the demon, um, and there is also. N not that a lot of the classes don't have built-in backstories, um, they're all very playable, but I think for even new players, when you have to have a demon who's telling you what to do and like giving you your power, you have to you have to forge some sort of relationship right away sure. with someone that you may not necessarily agree with. So what's interesting to me about warlocks is yeah. that, so warlocks are a relatively new character class, right? They weren't there when I started playing. They're sort of the, the arcane magic, so arc, you have diff two different kinds of spells, divine magic and arcane magic, and they're sort of the cleric of the arcane magic world, right? So in divine magic, clerics get their spells from their god. Right. In the arcane <laughs> world, you know, wizards study their magic and sorcerers, it comes from their blood, but warlocks, it comes from, like you're saying, this demon, this otherworldly creature yes. who's your patron. So, yeah, and either the demon sought you out or you sought the demon out, which is a, like, a new a, like a different take on it, but either way, like, it was not really your choice. It mm -hmm. was kind of one of the, a god or, or a Satan or whatever went you yeah. <laughs> you know and you're like oh my god I have yeah. to deal with this now so let's let's talk about uh, Raviel and sort of how she started out in her okay. village and how she came to be uh, uh, a warlock yes I got a lot of my ideas actually from the backstories that they provide you okay. um, which I, I think is a great resource for when you're coming up with a backstory and how you got to where you are she was a war leader chosen to lead tw like a, a squadron of about 12 people to fight Fight something otherworldly, and basically she was the lone survivor. So okay. now she's dealing with survivors' guilt. Everyone else died. She's trying to deal. With how did I survive when they didn't? Um, that's where she got her demon. The demon like uh, got very obsessed with the death around right. the war and the battlefield, and kind of infected her. So you you led your men into an ambush and experienced their death firsthand. <laughs> and instead of becoming president of the United States, you got a demon and became. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about uh, the the warlock, your your patron, your otherworldly patron. Yeah. Uh, you chose the Hexblade. Yes, and that is definitely nice. a a warlike kind of yeah. patron. So the Hexblade, it's a it's a creature from the Shadowfell, right? Mm -hmm. That has a warlike disposition. It's attracted mm -hmm. to war. It's attracted to death. It's attracted to blood, um, and it's sort of a martial character. So yeah. you you get spells and stuff and magical powers from the Hexblade, but mostly you get more martial abilities, the ability to. Right, to and and the way that like I'm using the metaphor is that she's a little concerned that because she's just cursed, she was cursed before the demon that like uh, she brings death with her. Uh -huh. Um, and and while she does want to you know bulk up and and be really good with her martial skills and be really kind of formidable, it's also the, a double edged. Hexblade, because <laughs> okay. because then she also would be able to do so much damage that that she might kill people, and then does de does does death follow her? Does she initiate death? Does yeah, it, it it's a dilemma. But yeah, that's why that's I like awesome. that's why I like warlocks because you you are. And you innately have a dilemma to deal with. That's awesome. I really love this character. Uh, I'm super excited. And I really enjoy warlocks as well. One of the fun things for me about a warlock is that uh, you get uh, sort of two characters to play in some ways. You're going to play your character, Araviel, but then you also have, well, my patron 
told me this or my patron. And I get a chance to sometimes play that patron to yes. and say, this is how your patron intervenes. But you also have the power to say, my patron intervenes in this way. So you mm -hmm. get that extra layer. It's a really super fun. Yeah, the way that I imagine the, the patron uh, interacting is through the fibers of plant life. So oh, whether cool. it's like the rings of a tree or the the way the blades of grass actually form and you know how you can just see patterns um, or even, yeah, the bark of a tree, how it just might form a word or a number or something. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. There'll be so much to work with there. I'm so excited. <laughs> All right. So let's, this is sort of the first part of your life. So let's take okay. you from first level character up through this traumatic experience mechanically now that we've talked about it story-wise. <laughs> okay. Wise. Okay. Um, and so this will be the, this is the, the rolling of dice and making choices kind of part. So you start as a level one character. You've got your abilities over here. You've got your saving throw uh, proficiencies are already filled in. We don't have numbers here because we're going to level you up to five and then okay. we'll do a bunch of math off, ca <laughs> off camera mercifully okay. so we can fill in all of those things. So, But you're proficient in wisdom and charisma saving throws because those are important for warlocks. Mm -hmm. the, the main ability being charisma, um, other abilities, uh, wisdom is a, is a strong, important part of that. Mm -hmm. You've got some skills that you're proficient in already. You're proficient in insight and intimidation and investigation. Some proficiencies, warlocks are proficient in light and, uh, and, and I think light armor but medium armor and shields because of the hexblade for you. Mm -hmm. um, and then languages you speak a handful of different languages including of course common and elvish you've got some basic powers at first level you've got your uh your elf powers you can avoid being charmed and being magically put to sleep and uh -huh. you've got your packed magic from your hex blade and this is the magic that the hex blade gives you so that's your first level character uh start with nine hit points um, because that's your d8 which is your hit dice plus your constitution bonus of one so nine is your starting hit points but when you move to level two, so this is your level one, level two happens while you're a war leader and everything. So we're gonna roll some hit points. Okay. Uh, so the first thing you'll do, so, uh, so you can theoretically take five, that's a, a rule in the book. I don't want to, I we like roll rolling dice. dice. That's what we do, yes. yeah. Yes, okay. So let's see what we get. Mommy be good to me. Nice, you rolled a seven. Seven. Plus one is eight, so let's uh, let's modify that guy right there and make it uh, seven. Are we, are we just doing, we're going to two right now? We're just going to two right now two, and then we'll and then move on beyond it. Okay. Yep. Ah. So, and we'll kind of walk through the whole thing. So okay. the other things that you get at level two, we're going to turn back to uh, Warlock here. And, uh, you know, the, one of the great things about the way this book is laid out is that you've got the full progression of your levels. The mechanical stuff, really easy to follow here. The story stuff comes from us. The mechanical stuff, super easy to follow. One of the book things here. I like doing is, like, I, it's... But like making a wish list, like I know what's coming <laughs> sure. up. So then you're like, okay, well, when I get to this, this is the thing well, that I'm going to These will all be up. super fast. <laughs> 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 so the first thing that you get uh, at level two is you get your hit points we did, and then you get your Eldritch Invocations. You've got a whole selection of them here. There's a couple that I thought might be kind of cool given the nature of your Hexblade, but you can do things like Agonizing Blast, which mm. means when you shoot somebody with one of your spells, they, they, it causes them extreme pain. That's probably not how your character is going to roll, <laughs> given your worry about causing pain. But you get lots of things like the Armor of Shadows. and Well, um, the way I'm going to build her, actually, okay. is some of the things that she has isn't her choice, but the demon is going <laughs> to incite okay. some pain. So she okay. might okay. be a pain dealer beyond her control. Okay. At second level, you gain two Eldritch Invocations Ooh. of your choice. So... Uh, we get to choose two of these guys. Okay, sweet. Does anything like appeal to you at first glance? I know you played a warlock before, so. Oh yeah, we have to do. It's always so new to me, though. Like, okay. It's always a. Well, that's super fun for everybody. I know. Okay, so a lot of these have prerequisites of levels, which I'm not yet. Yeah. So even so if I wanted to do level. Meyer the Mind, maybe later, because yeah. that's a fifth level. That's a fifth level one, yeah. I actually think I want to buff my um, Eldritch Blast, which I definitely. So that's sort of a default cantrip that, yeah. that a, a spellcaster, a warlock would use. It's just mm -hmm. basically a little blast of Eldritch power, right? So you're going to make that more powerful. Okay. Yeah, but I like the idea. I think it. It's, yes, Repelling Blast. Okay. Um, when you hit a creature with Eldritch Blast, you can push the creature. So in my mind, the metaphor would be like, I don't want to hurt you. Get away That's from awesome. me. So but let's, while I'm doing some so serious let's damage. So add Eldritch Invocations over here to your powers, okay. and then we'll just start enumerating them, and the first one is Repelling Blast. Okay. Invocation will do... That's cool. Tennessee. Yeah, we can always look it up. Usually what I do is I put the page in the player's handbook there so I can quickly flip into it. Ooh, not a um, bad idea. 
It's a little hint there. Oh, and, and then, I get two. Oh my you, god. You get two. So you've got oh, uh, armor of shadows is a big one uh, okay. because you're martial. I mean, that's one that I might suggest. It just it, it just uh, allows you to cast magic armor on yourself, so okay. you can be in a place where you don't have armor Done. on. So um, beguiling right. influence gives you proficiency in deception, but no, you don't have that already. No, so yeah. that would allow you to beguile and trick people. If you're feeling in that in that mode, no, I want to play. I've never really played a character who really actually tries to do everything right. No. <laughs> she might make a mistake, but I've always As been a, a little bit like, I'm gonna fuck with things. Perfect. Um, so I see. I play mostly paladins, so I'm the opposite <laughs> of you in that respect. Um, I I like the idea of armor of shadows. Let's do it. You sold me. Okay. On cool. That? So that's just a, a free mage armor that doesn't really count against my spell slots. Yep, it just allows oh. you to cast magic armor on yourself. Or does it? Nope, it's you, at will. At you will. just cast magic armor on yourself. Is But that's still an action though, right? Yeah, it would take okay. an action to do so. Yes. Okay, free mage armor. So that's our second level. Ooh. Now, while you are still learning to be a war leader and getting your command and everything, we're going to level to third level as well and then talk Sweet. a little bit about that. So, Give me that dice. at third level, yeah, first the thing to do at third level, exactly that. You're going to roll more hit points. Okay, mama, love me. Okay, not the worst, no, but not the best. Four plus one, five, five more okay. hit points, not so bad. So, we're at 22 now. 22. For those of you keeping track at home. <laughs> so, the big thing that you get as a warlock at third level is your packed boon. And this is after being a servant of the Hexblade. Mm -hmm. you, he's going to give you a boon. And the boon is one of three things. It's either the Pact of the Chain, which is you get a familiar a creature that comes with you. It's actually a, a demon or something like that manifesting as a cat or a toad or a dog or whatever. Uh, Pact of the Blade, you get a deeper connection to your weapon. Um, and then Pact of the Tome, where you get more spells, a spell book with some more spells in it. Mm -hmm. So th those are your three choices. Do any of those appeal to you? So immediately I'm going to Pack to the Blade just mm. to stay super basic and on track. Well, for um, the hex blade that but, makes sense. Yeah, right? it makes sense. But yeah. I also am wondering, because this is part of character creation, yeah, what yeah. other what are the other party members? Um, I'm, I want to consider like if there are like too many spell other, other spell casters or whatever. So interesting. So that, that's uh, it's an important question. Um, <laughs> I think the way that we're doing character creation for this particular adventure, because we have to be separate, is your lives are going to step forward into the place where you all come together. So, oh, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, so I, mean, I think it matters for party balance, as you're saying, and as yeah. a conscientious player, I think it matters. But specifically for this campaign, I'm a conscientious player. <laughs> you absolutely are. I don't. I didn't expect to say that to you, but clearly you are. <laughs> um, <laughs> So it's important. It's an important thing as we play together. But I think for this case, I want it to really be about this is the part before you get to the city, before okay. you get the rest. So what what appeals to you for your character? I mean, my otherworldly patron, which I will have to come up with a name for her. Um, she's going to give me Pact of the Blade for sure. So now with it just Pact makes the Blade, sense for her. Yeah, absolutely. And you can use this spell now to to create a packed weapon in your empty hand. Basically. The weapon that you've chosen, I think you, you, you use flail as your main weapon, right? Yeah. So cool. Uh, so rarely seen. So flail's a, a stick with a chain and then either like a ball or another spiked stick on yeah. it. What a cool weapon. Which I've been reading some R.A. Salvatore and and he, I just ran into a character who like slides into battle and I'm gonna totally do this. Gets on her back and starts kicking and like and like using her weapon. So that I think awesome. is gonna be super awesome. inspiring. So with the pack of the blade, you can make that weapon appear in your hand whenever you want to, yeah. uh, and it counts as magical for the purpose of overcoming magic resistance. So there'll be some there's some creatures that you could fight that maybe you need a magic weapon to hit. No matter what this weapon is, when you manifest it in your hand, it counts as magical. So yeah. That's the pack of the blade. Okay. So cool. Write down pack of the blade there. Okay, so that's my Pact Boon, so yeah. that's not an invocation. Maybe I'll do that somewhere else. Then. The other thing that happens at this level, at third level, from a story standpoint, is you become a battle leader at this level. So this is when you're given your command, this is when you become a leader, and this is also will be when you lead your people into this terrible ambush. But as part <laughs> of becoming a battle leader in your tribe, you are gifted a magical weapon. Cool. You get a flail plus one. So <gasps> yes! Write, write that in your gear, just right in your equipment here. Okay. Uh, flail plus one, and what that is is plus one to hit, plus one to damage. We'll talk about the mechanics of that. You obviously know it, but when we get to the game. But this magical weapon, you can turn into your packed weapon as well. So this is a weapon that exists in sort of an extra dimensional space until you call upon it. Yeah, and then and I can then, dismiss it too. Yeah, and then done with you. if it's more than five feet away from you for any amount of time, it disappears by itself so nobody else can steal it. So this is your the weapon that you and your Hexblade Master Sort of share. That's so cool. Yeah, awesome. So, after this stuff that we talked about in the story and her life, she leads her party into the ambush. 
They are all <laughs> killed except for her. She's traumatized deeply. Mm -hmm. um, what we were talking about when we talked about this character is that would be when she sort of gets out. She leaves yeah. her tribe. She leaves her home. By the way, we're kind of reducing it. She definitely fought. They fought. Everyone fought. <laughs> she, it wasn't just like, ah, ambush, they're dead. Oops, bye. Just, like, <laughs> I, keep I, I keep connecting it back to Hamilton. I'm just like, just, you just child lead it. You're, you're out of there. Yes, exactly. Uh, no, so yeah, so she okay. fought valiantly. Yeah, that's right. The party died. <laughs> she wanted to save people. She tried real hard, but yeah. But in her shame ultimately. and guilt, she had to leave. She yes. couldn't even stay with her tribe. So yes. she makes her way to the city. Now, we're playing in Greyhawk, but not the Greyhawk necessarily. That's the one that was the uh, published, well, published once upon a time, but it's the Greyhawk. Hawk world that I've been playing in since I was 12. So, <laughs> so my awesome. friends and I have affected this world dramatically. The Greyhawk we're playing in 30 years later <laughs> um, <laughs> is, uh, is much different from the Greyhawk that you, that you remember. But the, okay. the free city of Greyhawk is still at the center of the Flanus. It's still the most important city in the Flanus, arguably. It's about a quarter of a million people at this point, and this is sort of where you end up. And I think seeking... And we're about to affect your, you're affecting, your world. You're going to affect our world. Yeah. You may run into some of the old characters that I played with. It's all super fun. So you make your way to the city, and I think given your background, your martial background and everything, it makes sense as you try to find employment, probably some bodyguard work, maybe guarding mm -hmm. some caravans and eventually you find your way into the city guard mm -hmm. um, and sort of rise up the ranks from like a beat cop they're called the crimson cloaks in my version of greyhawk mm -hmm. beat cop up through maybe you're flirting with the idea of becoming a griffin guard which is sort of the elite fighting squad oh. but i think because of your arcane background people notice your magical abilities and stuff and direct you into the Inquisitors. And the Inquisitors oh, are a good. magical investigation group, basically, oh my gosh. that you okay, belong cool. to. So you become an Inquisitor during this time. Okay. So that's levels as you're moving to level four and level five. So let's mechanically deal with those guys here too. So um, level four, you're gonna add hit points, obviously, as we always do. All right, trim it right. <laughs> oh my god! Right. Always talk to your dice. That's a seven <laughs> on the die. Plus one for your Plus constitution. One. So that's eight. We're up to thirty. Up to thirty hit points. Awesome. Babies. Um, and so at level four, you get some more spell stuff going on. But the big thing that happens at level four isn't a power that's associated with warlock. At level four, when you reach fourth level in any class, you get the option to add some ability score points. Basically, you've been training your abilities. Um, there's an alternate rule where you can add feats instead of ability scores. We're going to stick to the main rule here. So awesome. what you basically you get is you get two points. You can add them both to the same ability score or one to two different ability scores. Okay. Um, so let's look at what you've got going on here. Also, my flail, I think I, I think I, I really don't remember, but are flails finesse? Like I can use my decks to... I think so. Let's, uh, let's I, find I just want to make sure. Let's do the, let's do the ability let's add do... first and then we'll find out if well, the flail to use your deck. No, let's oh. do oh, that wanna, because wanna... Cause I, I've got a negative one strength. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into the book here <laughs> and we're going to look for your weapon. Which is right here in the in the weapons table, armor and, and finesse means weapons. I can use so dex what or yeah. Or so what strength. finesse means a finesse weapon you can use as a strength thing. You can do primarily with strength, or you can use it with dexterity finesse. Yeah. This is sort of the Arya Stark uh, <laughs> yes. sword fighter, right? So a flail right here. It's just a bludgeoning weapon. It's, bludgeoning. it's only strength based. Oh, so okay, sure. You're not super strong right now, so that might be something that you would consider. That changing. is hundred percent what I'm going to do okay. because I'm at negative one strength right now, and I'm. But I'm. I'm not mad about it. Like obviously, I'm not super well trained in it, but I like people with flaws or lower scores and sure. things. So, so we're so, gonna add two to my strength, which is an eight right now. Yeah. We're gonna give her a 10. And that'll be plus zero then to your strength. So you got no modifiers, but also no penalties. But here. I do got a magical flail plus one. Yes, so. you do. And so basically the, the idea of this is you're training yourself, you're fighting, you're you're doing training with the other other uh, city watch, bodyguard duties, and you know, all of that kind of stuff, and just buffing yourself up essentially. Going to the gym, lifting <laughs> some weights, getting a little strong. All right, and then the last thing is you level to level five. While you are an inquisitor, you're gonna level to level five. Sweet. Um, and at level five, you again add hit points. All right. Oh, love me. No, oh. no, David. So here's the thing. That's a one. When by I the roll, way. <laughs> because I ask my players to roll hit points instead of just taking five, because I like to see the dice roll too. Oh, okay. One of the things that I always do for them is if you roll a one, let's re-roll it. I don't. Okay. I, I want you to be able to stand and fight and have fun. So let's re-roll that one. Yes, on your ones hit are dice no only. fun. Okay, I'm gonna hit happen in the game. <laughs> All right, I gotta. What did I if say? If you roll last a one time? again, though, it's okay. Okay, a go. six. Okay, and then plus one Plenty. to your constitution, so that's seven. That's Guys, 37. 37 is great. And then the other thing that happens at level five is mostly you just get more magic. So again, because you're a spellcaster, you're getting more magic. So let's flip over to your spell sheet, which is the third sheet on here. 
and just talk really quickly about your spells. Okay. Now, mostly, the big hard thing is going to be choosing spells, and that's a task we're going to do off camera. There's so many spells to choose from. Okay. You're going to get a lot of spells, so that'll be your homework between now and when we play together. Got it. But in the short term, we do need to talk about your spell casting a little bit here. So your spell casting class is Warlock, right there. Uh, and Warlock is a charisma-based spell casting, so it's an innate relationship between you and your Hexblade uh, patron. Mm -hmm. So your spell casting ability is charisma, if you write that right there. And then the other thing that's important for Actually, I've right decided that my otherworldly patron, her name is Cha now. Cha? Cha. Okay. Cha. Make sure Cha -cha. you mark that down so we don't forget that. Okay. I'll remind you, I'll be happy to. Actually, it's Cha Cha. Cha Cha? Oh, perfect. Yeah, she, if you imagine her, she wears a boa. That's so Hexblade sure. flavor all over. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last two things we need to do here are your spell save DC. Now, if you cast a spell that somebody can resist against, okay. you need to resist against this number. And this is eight, mm -hmm. plus your proficiency bonus. At level five, this will be plus three. So let's write that in right there. Okay. That's part of the math we'll do later, but this one we need. So plus three, because okay. you're level five, plus eight, so 11, plus your charisma modifier. This is right now two. So 13 is that number. Okay. They will have to roll higher than 13 to resist your spells. Perfect. Similarly, if you make an attack spell, that Eldritch Blast we talked about, you're mm -hmm. going to have to roll to hit. Right, so you get a spell attack bonus, and that is your proficiency bonus mm -hmm. plus your charisma bonus. That is a plus five. Plus five. So, and then we'll choose spells, and you'll be able to cast a certain number of spells a day, and that'll all come in the homework as we do between us, between now and when we play. Sweet. So that's your character. I'm really excited about this. I I, I love the idea of a character whose personal nature is very different from her patron, and there's a little bit of tension between there. Mm -hmm. I think this is going to be super fun, yeah? Yeah. Okay. The last thing, as you're uh, part of the Inquisitors, you're level five now, um, you become an important part of, a, of an elite command squad. And we'll talk about this more on the day, but one of the things that you're granted at this point uh, is a horn of silent alarm. So on your gear over here on the first sheet in the center, it's right, horn of silent alarm. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. And what this does is it allows you to blow the horn and you can send a silent alarm to anyone within 600 feet of you that you choose. One person within 600 feet and you can do it four times a day. My horn of alarm will take the form of a subtle fart. <laughs> oh, perfect. This, is a, this character's <laughs> building up to be just a beautiful thing. <laughs> I'm, Danger! <laughs> I'm so excited for your contribution to the dignity of the Inquisitors. <laughs> That's going to be awesome. <laughs> Ashley, hey. Hey, good to, see, good to you. see you. All right, let's sit down and play some Dungeons and Dragons. Thank you for joining me here in my humble home. You haven't played Dungeons and Dragons before, have you? Nope. Okay. Have you played, are you a video game person? I've watched a lot of video games. Okay. I really grew up watching my brother play video games. Fair. He didn't let me play very much. <laughs> but, you didn't um, work that, ag that aggression today. And, yeah. But I was very helpful, because you know I'd be the one going like, well, why don't you try that door? And he'd be like, oh, there's a door there. Yeah. Oh, you're That's welcome. Good. So paying attention is your strong suit then. That, that is a strong suit of Perfect. Yes. <laughs> so I'm super excited to be able to play with you for the first time. One of my favorite things is teaching new people to play. And oh, I'm so glad. I've been doing each other for a long time, so I'm excited to do this. So, so when we talked about your character, um, uh, I asked you kind of what kind of character you wanted to play. Let's talk about that. Yeah, you know, coming at this without really knowing a whole lot about it, you used a very uh, helpful um, in for me, which was saying, well, who do you love on Game of Thrones? Yeah, well. and, and I was like, I mean, can I be Daenerys? Like, is that, <laughs> like, you know, and then so we really started talking about what I love about her and how, um, how she's strong, how she's a leader, but she's compassionate, and she... Um, she has this this family legacy to overcome and really prove that she's she's more than you know what some of her family members may have done sure. and and really finding her place in the world that um, that honors that legacy but also is her own. Yeah, so this is really exciting for me because I like I love the idea of that heroic character. I play lots of paladins in the game. Paladins are heroic knights. And I find that lots of people, I mean, people want to play interesting, cool characters, different races and lots of weird things, but just that, that pure heroic character is really fun for me to explore with you. So I really appreciated that So because I get to dig in. And so uh, when we, we looked at the, all of those things, it made sense to us and it made sense to me as kind of guiding you through this that you would be a human because that's what Daenerys is and that we would choose fighter. Um, and fighter is sometimes uh, dismissed as a character class because it seems like the most basic thing. You're a man of or a woman of fighting. Um, but fighter is a really versatile class and it allows us to put it in a place and let the character that you're choosing sort of shape how this thing works. 
Um, the other thing that was important that you, you talked about was the family legacy part. And I loved that because we're going to be playing in a big city. We're playing in a world called Greyhawk. And it's, it's a version of Greyhawk. So Greyhawk was the original Dungeons & Dragons world that was published. But it's also the first world that I started playing in when I was 12. And so the version of Greyhawk we're playing in is the one that I've been playing in for over 30 years. And it has all the backstory and all the things that have happened since I've been playing the game, which means it's nothing like the Greyhawk mm. world that you would see now. But uh, but it, it, it will be fun for us. And, and we're going to play in the city called the Free City of Greyhawk, which is this big King's Landing style city, which is partly why I asked you about Game of Thrones. And we're going to be City Watch characters. So hearing the kind of character that you wanted to play in conjunction with the adventure that we're going to play, I wanted to create a really heroic police person. You know, um, So that's what this character is. And let me... So excited. Character. So, Ooh. what did you name her? I named her Leona Amblecrown. That's so awesome. Leona for Lion and Amblecrown from a list you gave me. <laughs> was, which was very helpful. <laughs> no, it's, it's um, Because, you know, I was like, I, I had to ask even, like, do I have a last name? Is right. that a thing? I really like the way that sounds. That's, that's awesome. And it's important that it sounds cool. That's the it, most uh, important thing for important. all of our first characters. So we rolled some uh, ability scores. So your basic character is here. This is your first level character, or oh. the skeleton of it anyway. Um, you've got your name and that you're a fighter and you're a soldier and all that stuff up here. Um, down the sides here, you have your ability scores. And now when we rolled ability scores, it was crazy. So the way that we did ability scores is we rolled 4d6 and subtracted the lowest one. That sort of that was the standard when I was first playing. Mm. Um, there's lots of different ways to do it, but that's how we did it. When we rolled your ability scores, they were off the charts. I mean, you are... A super, <laughs> yeah, you're a super heroic character. I'm so strong. In, you're incredibly strong. You're incredibly resilient. You're I mean, smart. Obviously. You're, yeah. Well, so. it, all of this reflects you. That's the important part of it. In the story of the game, um, you are a member of the City Watch. Can we talk a little bit about how you became a member of the City Watch or why you became a member of the City Watch? Well, I'm a legacy member of the City Watch. My whole family's been in the City Watch. And, um, you know, my father father was in the city watch and my brothers were all in the city watch so it seemed like a natural thing that I was going to do but mm. um, but my grandmother was also in the city watch okay. and she she's been a real role model to me because she was a really powerful woman and she actually um, rose to be a captain oh in awesome the city cool watch. cool and so we talked about your 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 brother and father sort of being like beat cops kind of like yeah. knockheads kind of guys yeah, but, they don't ask a lot of questions. Right, right. So you join the City Watch as part of this legacy. It's what you do. Um, and you spend your first couple of years of your career growing into your combat abilities, into your leadership style. Like you said, you're emulating your grandmother. So while you've got your knucklehead brothers there kind of encouraging you to, to, uh, to be a beat cop the way that they are, you have higher ambitions, yeah? So let's do some mechanical work about moving your character from okay. that first level and a little bit higher up. So we've got the first level character here. When you become a second level fighter, a handful of things mechanically happen in the game. And the first thing is you're going to roll more hit points. Your hit die are a d10. And what that just means is that uh, fighters are resilient. You have a lot of hit points generally. Um, and so whenever you roll hit points, you're going to roll a d10. You could choose just to take, I think it's six hit points for a fighter instead of rolling the dice. Um, that's a, a, one of the perfectly valid ways in the game to do um, additional hit points. However, I like to roll dice, and so I'm going to make you roll dice as well. Okay. Uh, so let's roll that d10. All right, so eight. Fantastic roll. You've already got, you start with 13 hit points. So you're going to add your constitution bonus to this roll. So you've got a plus three right. there. Eleven. So eleven plus your 13, so you've got 24. And I write that So here. just erase that guy and turn ah. it into 24. This is why we do it in pencil. Yes. So hit points are the first thing. Now you have 24 hit points. Um, and that'll be your at second level. Yes. So there's a couple things that you get from powers at second level too. And these are just powers granted to you because you are a fighter. The big one is that you get what's called an action surge. So over here is where your powers are listed. If you want to write action surge there for me. And what an action surge is, it, it means that once per rest, you can use it once and then you have to rest again to use it, you can add another action to your turn. So if you're in combat, and you want to use your action surge, you can take another attack or you can do another movement. You basically get to do more stuff in the middle of combat because you're a trained, specialized fighter. You can, in combat, you can really take charge. So that's what action surge is. So just add plus one action in combat. 
So that's second level. So you're kind of becoming a, a more versatile fighter here. You're moving up through the ranks. You're uh, uh, thinking about you know where you want to go. Again, your brother's encouraging you to stay there. Your dad is, I think we talked about your dad being a sergeant mm -hmm. um, before he retired. And so there's definitely legacy in the Crimson Cloaks, which are the base level of the City Watch. They're the beat cops. But you also have your eye on, there's the Griffin Guards, which are the elite uh, sort of the SWAT team or the elite strike force of the City Watch, and then there's the Inquisitors, which are the detectives and investigators and stuff, right? So you're moving up through second level, and then we move into third level. And third level is where, for a fighter, you get a whole bunch of decisions to make and a whole bunch of new powers, kind of come into your own as a character. It's also where you're going to choose sort of the direction of your career in the City Watch. So both, by this time, you've proven yourself. You're obviously, just from a pure talent standpoint, you've got a lot of abilities. You've got this family legacy. So now you're being recruited by the Griffin Guard who want you as part of their elite strike force. And you're being recruited also by the Inquisitors. The Inquisitors investigate murders and magical crimes and stuff. And while you don't wield a lot of magic, you are an impressive member of the City Watch. So you kind of have a decision to make here about which direction you're going to go. We talked, I think, about your oldest brother being a member of the Griffin Guard. Mm -hmm. While well, your younger brother's in the Crimson Cloaks, your oldest brother is a member of the Griffin Guard. So he really would like you to join the Griffin Guard. But there's this Inquisitor thing over here, and your grandma didn't take the knocking heads path. She was more of an inquisitor. I, I see myself following in my grandmother's footsteps. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So this is the point where let's do the mechanical work then and this is how you'll grow into an inquisitor in the city watch. So at third level, the first thing always is roll hit points. You'll get more hit points. So roll that d10 again. Another eight. Fantastic. You're adding your constitution bonus again. So it's 11. So now I'm up to 35. 35 hit points. At third level, 35 hit points, you are you can take a lot of punches. And then the big, the big choice for a uh, fighter at third level is what will your martial archetype be? So let's look at the fighter book here. Um, so we're in the book. This is the player's handbook. Um, this is fighter. Uh, it's laid out really well. There's a little table here at the top that tells you what happens at each level. This is the mechanical stuff. All of the story stuff comes from us. All the mechanical stuff is laid out really cleanly here in the book. Um, but when you reach third level, you get a mar martial archetype. And there are three in the player's handbook. And we're going to stick to those core ones. The first one is a champion. A champion is just like sort of you are the elite fighter. You are you could be a gladiator. You are the the best combatant in your unit. You're just your elite um, combat character. There's the battle master. Battle master is more about uh, leadership. Um, you've got lots of cool uh, tricks and maneuvers and stuff that you can do in combat. You can also help your companions, um, lead them through combat and make them more powerful as they fight. So it's more of a strategic role. Uh, and then the last one is an eldritch knight. An eldritch knight takes your fighting powers and adds a little magic on top of it. So you wield a little magic on top mm -hmm. of there. So do any of those appeal to you or feel like where Leona would would go? Um, as much as magic sounds fancy, I feel like Leona's a battle master. Okay. But she's really she's really about using her intelligence in the way that she fights because that's how you minimize casualties. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. And she's definitely got the intelligence to back it up too. She got a 15 intelligence as a fighter. She's yeah, exactly smart. exactly. So battle master. So there's a couple of things that you get when you become a battle master. So the two big powers are let's say student of war is the first one. And as a student of war, you understand sort of the world and the history of war. Um, mechanically, it only gives you a small thing, but from a flavor standpoint, this is your, your studying about war and combat yeah. tactics and strategies. Mechanically, you gain a proficiency with one type of artisan's tool. So this is, you know, sculptor's tools, painter's tools. Um, you could be you know, in blacksmithing or leatherworking or any of those kinds of things. So is there anything that, that flavor-wise kind of appeals to you from Leona's standpoint? Well, first I have a question as a yeah. newbie. Just what I choose, is that something that like might come up? That'll be like, oh, thank God, you know how to do leather work? Well, or, it's probably like... not going to matter in combat, mm -hmm. right? But there's lots of aspects to the game apart from just uh, fighting other, other creatures. Mm -hmm. There's interactions with other people. You do The adventure is in a city, so you'll mm -hmm. interact with other people. You, you'll have to investigate things. You're an inquisitor, so you'll investigate. So if you think about the flavor of the rest of the thing, that we can do and how that impacts our lives. You said blacksmithing? I did, yeah. I like I like blacksmithing yeah. for this because um, because that's that's getting in touch with how you forge the tools that then you use. That's awesome. I like that very much. So let's down here by your proficiencies. Mm -hmm. Let's write uh, artisans tools, blacksmith. And it means anytime that we, you know, need to like question a smith, I'll be right. like, yo. 
Or if you need to repair your armor, you got it too. Like yeah. all of that stuff, you've got all that. You're in touch with the things that make you who you are. The other thing that you get is combat superiority. Um, and what this essentially is, is you, as you said before, you are an intellectual in combat. You're thinking about your moves, mm -hmm. you're thinking about your mm -hmm. strategies. And so you get this thing called superiority dice. Um, so I would write combat superiority over here by your powers and leave a lot of room below because we're going to add a bunch of stuff to that. So the first thing is superiority dice, right below there. And you have four of them, and they are D8s right now. Uh, and what that means is that when you, when you do these maneuvers, and we'll talk about it when we play, um, when we all get together to play, but you're going to roll extra dice when you do different maneuvers, and they're going to have different effects. There's a whole bunch of these here. Obviously, I'm not going to have you read all of these maneuvers, but these are the kinds of things your character can do. But I pulled a few out that I thought might be interesting to you. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is Commander's Strike. So what Commander's Strike allows you to do is if you take an action on your turn, you can use a bonus action to direct one of your companions to strike as well. So you take a, a, a combat action and then you can let one of your companions on your turn also take an action, kind of taking a leadership role in combat. Mm. You've got distracting strike. Distracting strike is when you hit a creature, they're gonna have a harder time avoiding other people's attacks. So you've attacked them in a way that makes it easier for other people to hit them. Oh, that's also very like part yeah. of the team. Much, very much part of the team. Mm -hmm. You've got parry, pretty basic thing. When somebody tries to hit you, you can parry the blow instead of taking the damage. Precision attack is just a more Again, using your intelligence, finding a weakness, and making a precision strike. You've got rally, where you like rally your party to to you know work better in combat. Um, you've got riposte, which is if somebody attacks you, you immediately attack them right back. <laughs> um, and then the last one's a sweeping attack, which is you make an attack, but you attack a crowd of people instead of just one person. And you get to choose three of them. And I know it's a lot to choose from, but there's no wrong choice here. Everything is awesome. So, do any of those sound like things you might want? So commander strike means I can give up my strike to so, someone else? So, let me look at right here. It says when you take the attack action, so that means you're attacking, you can forego uh -huh. one of your attacks and then use a bonus action to have one of your companions attack. So I, I feel like... So in, like if, we, if someone was bigger or stronger or something? Yeah, maybe. Or if you're like in a flavor place and you kind of lunge in a little bit and then you instead tell your friend to attack. So instead of you're attacking, mm -hmm. you're telling your friend to attack. Um, so yeah, you give up one of your attacks in order to have somebody else attack in your place. Which is similar to distracting strike. So distracting strike is you're going to actually hit a creature. So you're going to attack and hit a creature. But when you hit them, you do it in such a way that they have a hard time defending themselves against other people. So on their turns, it'll be easier for them to hit that creature or that person. Okay, I, li I like distracting strike. Okay, we'll make a mark there. I definitely like parry. Okay. That seems smart. Yep, that makes sense. And then, oh, you... Explain things in a way that makes much more sense to me than the book. Oh, um, yeah, well, I mean, we'll learn this stuff as we go. Like, mm -hmm, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. summarizing. But the precision attack just makes you better at attacking. You're, you're using your intelligence targeting. Rally helps your crew work better. Repost was just attacking back when, uh, when somebody attacks you. Instead of trying to defend yourself, you just smack them right back. And then sweeping attack was... A bunch I'm going to go with repost because that's yeah. very much my personality. You okay. touch me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit back. That sounds like the sounds smart thing like to do in combat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll write the repost there. And this is also the time when you are, like you said, you're moving from being a beat cop, a crimson cloak, into the Inquisitors. And this is, and I think in this moment, as you make this choice, you move up while your like your brother is disappointed, is in the Griffin Guard, and you're, you know your father wanted to be a beat cop, but he's secretly proud. I think your mother interjects here, and she has a gift for you, um, and it is your grandmother's sword. So as you make this choice about being an Inquisitor, you're gifted with your grandmother's sword, and it's a long sword, but it's a magical long sword. It's a family heirloom. No one has earned this to this point. She tells you that this is something that your grandmother, she hoped for this for you, but nobody wanted to push you into this. But now that this has happened, here is your grandmother's sword. So let's write that down in your gear right here. So just put long sword plus one, and you can add flavor text here? to it to your grandmother's sword. Yep, it's right there in your equipment. And we'll talk about what that means when we you know, play the game uh, Long sword next plus time. one. Plus one. And that means it's a magical sword, so it's going to be easier to hit things with it, and it's going to do more damage to them. This fine, beautiful, silver-hilted sword that belonged to your grandmother. So you move into the Inquisitors. Uh, at first, it's, it's difficult. You're, you are a combatant. The Inquisitors are an investigation squad, and they deal a lot with magic. So this is a point where you learn a lot about the world of magic. Your horizons expand a little bit. However, again, given your natural tendencies, your determination, you really excel in this role, and because you've chosen Battle Master, you become put more and more in leadership positions. While you don't have magic and you don't know as much about the arcane when you investigate things, what you do have is 
a lot of presence, a lot of charisma, a lot of leadership ability. Um, so that's how you move up the ranks as we go into level four and level five. So let's do mechanically your level four stuff here. So the first thing always, we got hit points. So a little bit lower roll this time. You're focusing on more on your studies and more on the arcane sure. this time around. So, sure. But you still get to add plus three. Okay. So that's a six total. 41. So you're at 41. And the other big thing that happens when you're at level four, and this is for anybody who reaches level four in their class, is you get an ability score bonus. There's a, a, an alternate rule in the game where you could take a feat instead, and feats are just cool things that you can do, but it opens up a whole can of worms for us, so I want to stay to the straight and narrow, the basic rules. So we'll add an ability score bonus at level four. What that means is you get two points that you can add to any of your ability scores. You can add one oh. to two, one to two different scores, or you can add two to one score. Now, you already have an 18 strength. You're incredibly strong. You could raise that if you wanted to, but you're incredibly strong. Your dexterity is a 14. If you're wearing armor, that's about as, as high a dex as you need because anything higher than that, your armor is going to keep you from getting some of those bonuses. Your constitution is 16. That gives you a plus 3 to your hit points. Um, you could raise that to an 18 to get some more if you wanted to. That's your resilience, mm -hmm. your ability to take damage. Your intelligence is a 15. Um, now, interestingly, your intelligence is the first odd number that we've got here. And the bonuses mechanically in the game, the bonuses raise at even numbers. So if you added one point to here, you're going to get a plus three instead of a plus two. So you're going to want to think about, like, where do we want to be? Do I want to just be stronger and more resilient, or do I want to raise any of these other scores? And there's no wrong answers again here, especially since you already have such high abilities. Mm -hmm. So what's the real difference between intelligence and wisdom? That's great. Uh, so intelligence is sort of knowing things. It's the book learning. It's your capacity to learn new things quickly. Wisdom is a lot more your relationship to the world, your uh, insight to other people, sort of your, mm. you, you know, your, your sort of gravitas, and, and even some, in some cases your willpower and self-control. Um, well, relating to other people does sound like it's going to be important. Well, so charisma also falls into that. So charisma is, is this is more insight into other people. Charisma mm -hmm. is more your interactions with people like, like you would think of you know, for charisma. This is more how people view you, how you were able to make friends and, and, uh, and do that kind of stuff. So again, with leadership, as you say, charisma is probably important mm -hmm. as well. And interrogating suspects. Exactly. It also works. And it works the other way too. It's not just will people like you. It's can you intimidate someone? Do you understand them enough to? So, because these are odd, I might as well split them. So yeah, if you sp one point to each. Absolutely, that seems like a good strategy. So, so your wisdom goes up to fourteen from thirteen, and you become a plus two there. So this guy turns to plus two, mm -hmm. and then your charisma goes from fifteen to sixteen, and you're a plus three. Again, just an extraordinary set of abilities for this character. And then finally, you rise into the ranks, you, you're part of the Inquisitors, you are asked to join an elite squad of Inquisitors, so you have regular people you're working with, which is where we will start the adventure when we see each other next. Um, and so we'd have one last mechanical bit to do, and that's the level five mechanics. And there's two big things that happen there. The first is, yes, hit points again. Oh, and there's a ten. No, that's, that's not a zero, ten? that's a ten, yeah. Oh! I, but I like the, the, the impact, because I get to surprise you with the good, <laughs> good news. Yeah, no, it's a ten, so ten plus your constitution bonus. So it's 13 more hit points. Oh. So you're sitting at a solid 54 now, because you can take a lot of damage. And then the other big thing that happens, because you're a martial character at level 5, is that you get an extra attack. So when you take the attack action, uh, action now, you get two attacks, not just one. So we'll add that over here in your powers, extra attack. And that's just, again, something that martial characters like fighters get at level 5. The last thing that happens at this point is you're kind of rising in the ranks. Now you're becoming an important part of the Inquisitors. And uh, you are able to draw from your different armories when you're on missions. You're discovering lots of magic and crazy stuff. And some of that stuff ends up belonging to uh, the Inquisitors and to the City Watch in general because it helps you with their work. And one of those things is you end up, because your fighting style, we talked about a dueling fighting style when we talked originally, you fight with a sword and a shield. Kind of a standard, you know, powerful warrior character. You've got your grandma's magic sword, so you come across a magical shield as well. So in the equipment there, I want you to write Sentinel Shield. And what the Sentinel Shield is going to do for you, you just write this down and we'll, fit, we'll deal with what this means when we uh, play this next time, is you have advantage on initiative and perception. And so just quickly what that means, is initiative is the order that you act in combat. So you're going to have advantage there to act first, to be the decisive leader again in combat. And perception is, you know, just seeking things out, noticing things. You have uh, advantage there as well. And we'll speak about what advantage means in the day. So mechanically, that is your character. 
So uh, the story comes from us. Like I said, the mechanics come from the book, but this is what your, your fighter character is. So Leona now is fifth level. She's established in the Inquisitor. She's a powerful character. This is a lot of things. She's very resilient in combat. She's become a really wise over her time, very charismatic leader. Um, and this is the place where we'll find ourselves when we get back together and meet the rest of your party uh, when we play. So did, uh, did all this make sense? Does it seem yeah. fun? I mean, obviously I mean, it's a lot for right now. You've you've built me an incredible character. I just hope I live up to her. <laughs> I think that you will. I mean, the idea from it is from you, right? So this beginning thing, this thing that you wanted to play. And again, I'm really excited because these are the kind of characters that I love to play. These paladins, these paragons of, you know, sort of virtue, wait in and protect other people. And like this is, so I really love that you're doing that and I'm excited to see you do it. So oh, thank you thank so you. much for, for hanging out and doing this with me. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me to your well-established world. Hey. What's up? How are you? Good. Ah, oh, it's good to see you. Yeah. Let's uh, let's make a character. Love it. All right. So, you and I've been doing this a long time. I'm not going to ask you how many games you played or how long you played Dungeons and Dragons because it's as long as I have, which is a really long time. <laughs> um, but let's talk about. So we spent some time working on a character uh, uh, recently together right. for this game. Right. Um, you want to talk a little bit about that character for me? Yeah. So uh, the Gith race has been traditionally just a monster race. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've recently opened it up that you can play as either a Gith Yankee or a Gith Zerai. Yeah. And when we were talking about party makeup, um, it looked like we were gonna need a healer. Yeah. So to me, playing a Gith Zerai probably was more appropriate because they're more zen. The Gith Yankee are the warrior sure. crazy guys and the Gith Zerai, arguably just as crazy, but more in a zen way. And we talked a little bit about like how we felt about the Gith, because you and I have been playing for a long time, like you said, and they used to be monsters, in fact. Right. I have with me here my original Fiend folio Ugh. from back in the day. I know, that scared so the crap out of me as a kid. Technically, this is a Gith Yankee, so in yeah. the old game, they didn't look exactly the same. The Gith Zerai looked a little different. Right, the Gith uh, looked a little more uh, like humanish. hooded, yeah, yeah. Humanish, yeah. So were you always interested in the Gith? They just fascinated. I think I was afraid of them for a long time because of that <laughs> because cover. Of that stupid cover. Uh, and so they fascinated me. But the idea was that they were they were a slave race of the mind flayers. They broke free of that, but they couldn't agree on what direction to take. So they split into two factions. Yeah. Uh, normally, the Gith live in limbo, which is one of the planes, uh, the right. prime material plane that that our players will live in, that our world takes place in, but the Gith live in limbo. Right, and well, so, the, the, Gith, the Gith Zeri live Gith in limbo, Zeri, and yeah. the Gith Yankee live in, in the astral plane. Right, and the Gith Zeri, the big thing about the Gith Zeri is that they, uh, in limbo, they have to harness the chaos and uh, you know draw things out of it in order to live a stable life because limbo is just filled with chaos. So, right. So your name is? Narlac. Narlac, and here's your yeah. the beginnings of your character sheet. Right. So we talked about this. We talked about uh, Narlac starting uh, in a like a traveling, right, a traveling fortress. Okay. They travel around, and uh, they often uh, the Githeri come from Limbo in search of mind flayers, in search of Githyanki to fight. Mm -hmm. Those are their two main, sure, main sure. Uh, focuses. And my idea was that he would have been a cleric for for them on one of these missions, the first time he sets foot on the prime material plane, something happens to him. Something starts to bubble up in his blood. Okay, well that's cool. Let's, let's put a pin in that there and then let's okay. talk about, let's, let's bring our character from that first level character traveling around with his troop up to that point so we can kind of see the decisions and see us leveling up. We've got Great. the beginnings of our first level character here and this mm -hmm. is what you and I worked on together. Mm -hmm. um, so here's, I got a pencil for you. We got Great. some dice, yeah. got a D8 for hit points. Um, and so let's start with this first level character, just kind of talk through what we've got here and then we're going to step through the decisions that you'll make as we level this character up to level five so we can play. Great. Oh, cool. So that's this is our basic first level stuff. Your abilities here, you, you rolled all those abilities and uh, we've assigned them. We've got what skills we're proficient in, we've got some background information, and then we've got your powers over here. One of the important things about the Gith Zeri, uh, or Gith Zeri, is that you've got a couple of cool psionic powers, right? Yeah. So with your powers, uh, and this is uh, for the Gith, this is because they were the slaves of the Mind Flayers, right? So mm -hmm. the Mind Flayers are a psionic race. Um, they use their mental powers, not magic like we traditionally think of, but mental powers. And the Gith has spent a lot of time training in the same mm -hmm. manner. 
So I just want to talk about a couple of your powers that are a little bit different from what other people might have at this first level. Uh, so you have something at first level that's called Githzerai Psionics. And that, how that manifests is they use a magic spell, the spell Mage Hand that lets you move small objects, but where they're calling it Psionics for the Githzerai, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something you get at first level that's really cool. And then as you get into higher levels, you get more Psionic powers as you grow. So we'll come back and talk about that. But I just wanted to call that out because it's different from the other magic that we'll be talking about. Right. Right? We've got all that stuff for first level. So let's talk about what happens to you at first level. You begin traveling with your troop. You go on a couple of missions and adventures, probably fight some other Gith Yankee, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it comes time you've become experienced enough to move from a first level character to a second level character. Now there's a handful of things that happen to you at second level, which right here in the player's handbook. So if you're, you know, when you're walking through a character, the player's handbook does a really good job of laying out a table that shows you exactly what happens as you progress through your character level. So you're a cleric, we've got the cleric table here. Mm -hmm. um, and at second level, uh, you gain a couple of things. First is new hit points. Every time you raise a level, you're gonna increase your hit points. So we start with 10 hit points because you are a cleric and you've got a plus two to your constitution. And your hit die is a D8. And then for hit points, you can do a couple of things. You can choose just to take, in this case, a five. The book tells you you can just take five more hit points and add your constitution bonus. But I really like to roll dice. That's the yeah, way that we used to play back too. in the day. So let's roll some hit points for this level. Those yeah, great six. all right. Your constitution is 14, so you have a plus two bonus to your hit points. So let's add eight more hit points to so right there. I'm at eight. We're going to walk this up. Every time Boom. we level up, we'll do a little fun roll right here. Great. The other big things that you get at second level are, the big thing is your channel divinity. Um, and when clerics channel divinity, they draw upon the divine powers around them. Now you chose to be a, what your cleric, to, your divine source. Right, a uh, life. Life cleric. Right. Um, so Gitzerai don't really worship gods, generally speaking. They have Zerth, who they kind of talk about, but mostly right. they're about discipline and spirituality and mentalism and stuff. And so um, when we talked, we talked about just drawing, your, your divine life powers come from just drawing from the chaos of the cosmos and finding the threads of life, and that's where your divine power comes from. Mm -hmm. So uh, at second level, you get to channel divinity, and the channel divinity takes two forms, and the first one is turning undead. So Which I want to write awesome. down on your power sheet, yeah. yeah. So write channel divinity, turn undead, and with channel divinity, you get to use it once every time you rest. So if you rest a short or long rest, you can do it again. Um, turning undead means you can just drive undead away from you, skeletons and zombies and stuff. And then when you become higher level, you can actually destroy them. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, the other thing that you get with your channel divinity, uh, because you are a life cleric, is you can preserve life with your channel divinity. So we'll add that under your channel divinity as well, preserve life. And that lets you heal your party kind of en masse. Um, the same way that the channel divinity works, you can heal your party. The other thing that happens to you at second level is on your first like major mission, as part of your training and the equipping of your mission, you're gonna get a drift globe. This is a magical item. So I'd write this under your equipment, okay. uh, drift globe. And what this is, is it's a little globe that you can make light up at will. And once a day, it can cast full daylight and it floats along in the air behind you. So it kind of follows you. How around. long does that last? Uh, it can float as long as it wants to and the, and the light spell can happen at will. The daylight is just once a day. So okay. anytime that you want, you can have it drifting around. It's important when you're sailing the seas of chaos right. in limbo to have, have light. Got to have clear sight. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so it, there's a, a, some missions going on, and you're out with your caravan like we were talking about, and you're traveling the, the plains in search of danger and maybe trade with your group. Learning um, how to heal my party. Learning, learning how to heal your party. how to, you know, be the... Make sure everyone's okay. Yeah, and you know, drawing from the chaos, like we talked of, drawing healing from the chaos. Mm -hmm. um, so you work work through your second level, a bunch of missions, and then we move to level three. Level three is an easy level for clerics. In level three, you gain hit points and more spells. And we'll talk about your spell casting in kind of at the end of this. But all along here, because you're a cleric, you're drawing divine spells. You're getting more and more powerful spells. So the big things here are: let's move to level three. We're going to roll more hit points. Come on. Eh. Two plus yeah. two for your constitution, so four more. So we're at 22. That's great. Not too bad. And the other big power here is you just add spells. So we're just adding more spells, and again, we'll take care of those at the end of this um, once we've calculated everything else. Now, when you're a third level cleric and you're a powerful cleric, now you're going out on more important missions and everything. Talk to me about this first mission to the Prime Material Plane. The fortress lands, and Narlek already feels something different. And when he sets foot on the prime material plane, which is basically our planet, the right. planet that 
our adventure is going to take place on. And we're playing in Greyhawk, so this is uh, they call it the Flamus. Mm -hmm. So yeah, great. And when he first sets foot, he just feels something different. He feels almost like an electricity mm -hmm. flowing through his blood. Cool. And uh, he deserts his troop. He the, at his first opportunity, he just runs off into a forest like a madman right. uh, and doesn't stop running for hours and hours. Now when we talked about this, so we, we talked previously that the Gith uh, Zeri live in limbo, which is a, a plane of chaos. Right. Um, there's a group among the Gith Zeri called the, uh, the Anarchs who Anarchs. help to harness the chaos and kind of centralize the society. And uh, that's something that is naturally present in some Githzerai. And what we're kind of talking about is that maybe that there was that spark of that Anarch, that ability to harness the chaos and really connect to the chaos in, uh, in Narlac. And when you hit the Prime Material, for whatever reason, the combination of that ability to harness the chaos and the way the Prime Material plane works just exploded sort of the chaos in his brain and his, in his blood. Yeah. That, I, and I think that that's, that's a really cool tie back to the, the Gith themselves as well as getting you into the world that we're going to play in. Right, because you right? got to, why is this Gith here? You know, right. you have to have a good backstory. And so the other thing that, that happened when we talked is we talked about uh, you wanted to multi-class your character. Right. right? Yeah. So, so what that means is, uh, you know, you you're started as a cleric, you spent three levels as a cleric, but when you move into the four, into fourth level, you decided you wanted to choose sorcerer. Right. Um, so you're going to have three levels of cleric, and then you're going to move to sorcerer. So this mm -hmm. makes you a third level cleric and a first level sorcerer. So we've got the sorcerer table here. Sorcerers have the same thing the clerics do. We've got a little table telling you what you what do when you get there. Are. Among the first things that you get when you're a sorcerer is you're going to get some more hit points. Now, you're not going to roll the same hit dice you did for a cleric. Sorcerers don't have as many hit points as clerics do. Right. So now you roll a six-sided die. So let's get those hit points. So two, two. Plus, another, plus another four. Right, because I'm right. still going to be able to use my constitution you still use your bonus constitution no matter bonus. what. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And we should, should we talk about sorcerers first? So yeah, let's talk about sorcerers right, right now. So we got the hit okay. points. The next thing you get is a sorcerer bloodline. So yeah, so a sorcerer uh, is a magic user, kind of like a wizard, but it's innate magical power. Right. And it's based upon something in your past, your history, your ancestry, or whatever. They call it the sorcerous bloodline. Now we've been talking about chaos. Chaos, absolutely. Makes perfect sense. Absolutely. And so one of the sorcerous bloodlines is chaos, that you've got just roiling chaotic magic in your blood, in your veins, and that's where your power comes from. So we're going to choose chaos as our, as our font of sorcery, or as our sorcerous bloodline. Your spell casting can unleash chaos, essentially. So right. whenever you cast a spell, I can choose, as the, as the dungeon master, to have you roll on a table that your spell can have unpredictable outcomes. So I'll choose that probably most likely when you're under stress, when it's really when things are critical. At all the worst times that bad things could happen, that's when you'll have to roll and right. see. I think a lightning bolt's going to come out, and then a bunch of butterflies fly out of my face. The, the good news about 5th <laughs> yeah. edition, too, is that mostly those chaos effects happen in addition to the spell actually working. Oh, okay, so good. Rarely <laughs> is it, I try to cast lightning bolt, and I turn you into a goat instead. It's more <laughs> other things happen in addition to it. You also have a thing called Tides of Chaos. Um, and when you want to use Tides of Chaos, you can choose to add the uh, advantage on an attack roll. Basically, you're going to draw in those threads of chaos that you pull, you're going to make a magical attack, and then you're going to add advantage to it. And we'll talk about advantage in the game, but it makes it more likely for the attack to work. When you use that, however, you have to roll on the chaos table. So something <laughs> else might happen alongside of it. So those are the things that kind of happen at first level for that sorcerer, um, with, with your bloodline anyway. Additionally, now because you chose to multi-class, you become a broader sort of jack-of-all-trades character. Mm -hmm. um, you don't get as deep a power set as everybody else who will move up to fifth level in their main class, but you broaden your power set. So some more things happen. You're going to be more proficient in more things. Proficiency is an important mechanic in the game and basically it helps you roll higher. It adds to your, to your rolls. Um, and so you become proficient in additional saving throws. We'll talk about saving throws in the game. But constitution and charisma saving throws you become proficient in as well. You're already proficient in wisdom and charisma because of cleric, but you're going to add constitution to that set as well. So Great. what we do is we fill in this little circle mm -hmm. next to constitution right there. You're going to get some more skills. Uh, so you're more proficient in, in more skills, again, broadening that set of powers, becoming more of a jack-of-all-trades. We're going to add Arcana and Deception. You already had the other skills that sorcerers have access to. So we'll add Arcana as proficient and Deception. You've got your Sorcerer's Origin, and you're going to get a second sheet of spells to cast. And we'll talk again about Crazy. spells 
in all a the spells. Bit. All I the want, spells. I want them all. all right. So, so that's how you move into level four. You come to the primary trail plane, you go crazy. And so, as I talked about before, we're going to be playing an adventure in in Greyhawk on the Flanus, in actually my living version of Greyhawk that I've been playing in since I was twelve, and this is the, what I've been running games in. So, I will just give a disclaimer that it is not the standard last published <laughs> version of Greyhawk. It is a very, very. But that's far, okay. In D and D, you can make it your own. Anything that you want. It is very far from what the standard is after thirty three years of <laughs> of playing in this world. But you're in Greyhawk, and you're going to make your way to the free city of Greyhawk. It's a big, bustling city in my world of about a quarter of a million people, sort of like King's Landing in the middle of the Flanus. It's a, a free city-state filled with people from all over the place, and, and while Gith are not uh, unheard of on the Prime Material Plane, they are rare. Sure. The free city is a place where you might end up and, and feel a little bit less of an outcast. Well, Gith, you know, luckily they are humanoid, mm -hmm. so with a... Heavy robe and a you know or heavy yeah robe and a hood over top you know yeah he could pass as a human exactly and kind of lose human. yourself in the throngs of, mm -hmm. of the big city no one's um, gonna notice or care sure and so I feel like around this time when you're in the big city this is when you're beginning to harness those powers those things that made you crazy so like what point do you think you it turns from I'm crazy running in the forest to I'm getting this under control well I think actually he had quite a a stint in the forest, mm -hmm. that he sort of was wandering for a while and luckily with his cleric powers and spells he could sustain himself mm -hmm. and when he snapped out of it and when he came to the city is he would have earned maybe that, that fourth level mm -hmm. on his sort of solo adventures re-harnessing his lawful nature right. and trying to uh, get it under control. And he has the great discipline of, of the Gazerai right. because of, that's where he came from. Um, and because uh, us being a sorcerer is more of a natural source of magic than wizardry, which is studied, he can do that on his own in the wilderness. Certainly. Mm -hmm. So I think he gets to the free city of Greyhawk and maybe begins looking for a place to, to find a place in society. Right. Um, he knows he can't go back, or at least he feels that he can't go back to Limbo. Sure. Um, but uh, he still, now that his brain is back to normal, he wants to uh, start doing something for society again. And a good place for that might be the City Watch, the Free City of Greyhawk City Watch. With the City Watch, there are a couple of different factions. There's the regular City Watch that they call the Crimson Cloaks, again, in my Greyhawk. There is the elite sort of SWAT team of the City Watch. Those are the Griffin Guards. Uh, and then there's a third piece, and those third piece are called the Inquisitors, mm. and their job is to investigate magical crime, horrific and magical crime. Um, and so I think given the power that he's got, given sort of his origins and trying to find a place in the world, he would have maybe gravitated toward a place where he could contribute. He is, after all, a cleric of life. He's still, I think, someone who wants to, based upon all the things that you've told me, someone that wants to contribute and help, uh, and so I think it's Maybe he made his way uh, to that city watch and uh, offered services even um, to that group. Do you feel like that's maybe something that... That sounds totally within yeah. what he would do. And so uh, once they evaluated you and found out how powerful a sorcerer you are and how powerful a cleric that you were, you would have been welcomed to and maybe assigned temporarily to a mission with the Inquisitors. Great. Which is where we're going to find you when we all get back together. So okay. we've got one more level to do, and this is your fifth level. We'll move you to the fifth level character. And so this is a level two sorcerer, technically. You're third level cleric again, now you're level two sorcerer. So we add a few more things. First again, hit points. So sorcerer hit points. Yeah. Oh yeah, so you right. roll the six, plus two, you got eight, eight. more hit points there. Nice. It's the most you could possibly have, given your constitution. Mm -hmm. So I feel pretty good about that. That's fantastic. Four hit points. And then you get a couple of things as a sorcerer at uh, second level. Um, and this is this goes in the vein of what we talked about about sorcery being a, a natural magic. It's less of a studied magic and more natural magic. It isn't as rigid. It's a lot more flexible. So you get something called font of magic that comes at second level. Mm. If you want to write this down under your yeah, powers as well, sure. font of magic. And what comes along that is sorcery points. Right. Those so are cool. Yeah. So you get two sorcery points, and what these are is these are points that you can spend to do cool things with your spells, especially as you advance in higher levels, but even at this point, you can do cool things with your spells. The first thing is, uh, you've got a thing called flexible casting that you get right away at second level, uh, Sorcerer, which allows you to create a new spell slot. 
Um, so all people who can conduct magic and use magic, whether it's divine magic like your cleric or arcane magic like your sorcery, you've got a certain number of spells that you can cast a day. Your body just can only channel a certain amount of spell energy. And when you're multi-class like you are, there's a special table way back here that tells you how many spells you can cast. So we've got some homework to do yeah. this next week uh, to deal with that. But, uh, but what this does, this flexible casting allows you to do, is it allows you to spend two sorcery points and get another spell slot back. So it'll add the ability to cast one more spell. In desperation, you'll dig deep into your body and cast just one more spell. Um, so that's your big thing now is like flexible casting. That's great. Uh, and you can spend sorcery points to add spell slots. I think the other thing that uh, that you've done as you're kind of searching around the city and looking to what, what what you want to do is some of the money that you had with you, some of the valuable metals and valuable gems that you brought with you from Limbo, you bought something for yourself as you joined this new life as part of the City Watch. And this is a cloak of protection. So I'm going to add that That's magic very, to, your, to your list here. Yeah. Very good. So whatever armor you decide to wear, whatever else we're going to have in our standard gear, you're going to have a cloak of protection. And this gives you a bonus to both your armor class and to your saving throws. Yeah. So whether you're protecting yourself against weapons or against magic, you're going to have extra protection. Yeah. So the one other thing that I want to do before we finish up today and then do our homework, I'll assign you some homework about picking spells and things and doing some math here, is I want to talk about your spells. So you have two kinds of spells. With your cleric, you have divine magic, and with your uh, sorcerer, you have arcane magic. So what I've got here in this pile is two spell sheets, if you want to pull those guys out. Sure. And there are a couple of important numbers here that are based upon, you know, your level and the things that, that we have for your Sorcerer and for your Cleric already. So since we have the book open to Sorcerer, let's start here with Sorcerer. And up at the top of here we have your Spellcasting Ability. This will mm -hmm. be your Sorcerer side. So Spellcasting class is Sorcerer. Yeah. Spellcasting Ability is Charisma for Sorcerer. So right. you're using your innate natural ability to channel magic and we're going to use Charisma for that. So then we do a, a yeah. Spell Save DC and what this is is some, some of the spells that you cast People are going to have to make a saving throw against, and again, we'll get into this when we get into the game. But the higher that difficulty check is, the more powerful you technically are as a wizard, the more powerful your spells are. So your uh, spell save DC is 8, mm -hmm. plus your charisma modifier. Well, um, 2. 2, so, so 10, 10, plus your proficiency bonus, which is 3, so 13. 13. Great. So if you cast a spell that needs a save, they have to save versus a 13, and again, we'll get into that in the game. The other thing here is a spell attack bonus. Your spell attack bonus is if you're casting a spell that makes you roll an attack, you're going to shoot somebody with a ray or something like that. Right. And that is your proficiency bonus. Okay, three. Plus your charisma modifier. So plus five. So it'd be plus five. If you're going to make a spell attack, you're plus five. Great. Uh, on the cleric side, we have something very similar. These are divine spells. So divine spells, instead of being based on your personal innate charisma, they're based upon your wisdom, your ability to like we were talking about, pluck the threads of chaos and find the life, the lifelines in those threads. And so your divine spells are based upon the same kind of thing, eight, plus your proficiency bonus, which is the same, Okay. three, plus your wisdom modifier now. Right, which is higher, uh, another three. Another so, three. Yeah. So it's eight plus three plus three, so 14. 14. And by so the way, the ability would be wisdom, Wisdom is, right? wisdom okay. is the ability, yep. Okay. The DC is 14. And now your spell attack bonus, again, is calculated in the same way. It's your proficiency bonus mm -hmm. plus your wisdom bonus. Great. So plus, so plus six. six. So if you're casting offensive cleric spells, you'll have a plus six to those spells. And that's kind of the basic of your magic. Now, the big task that you're going to have is going to be choosing spells. And there's a lot of those. We're not going to do them here right now because it would take us a long time. You've got a lot of spells to choose from. But I want to talk just a little bit about choosing spells. And one of the things that new players do a lot when they're choosing spells is they will look just for the spells that do the most damage. They're going to look for offensive spells. And I think that that's okay if you're playing a very aggressive offensive character and that's how you want to roll as a sorcerer. It's harder as a cleric to do that, of course. But I want to just remind you that when you choose your spells, let's choose some offensive spells, but also some spells that don't necessarily have offensive or healing components that you might be able to use in other circumstances. Sure. Yeah. So just to make sure that you know, a play is not just combat, and especially in our adventure when we're going to be in a big city. There's going to be a lot of conversing with other people. There's going to be a lot of environmental things that happen. And so just to remember that play is not just combat. All right? Oh, yeah. This is an awesome character. I'm super excited. Me too. Hey, Jade. <laughs> How's it going, David? How are you? I'm good. Oh. Good to see you. Let's, uh, let's play oh, some Dungeons & Dragons. I'm super excited about that. All right. 
So, uh, first I want to ask you, what's your experience with Dungeons & Dragons? Have you played the game before, other role-playing games? I must have played a round or two when I was like 12. I did a lot of Marvel superheroes as oh, a kid. Sure. So I was really into comics, so I did that. But since then, I really haven't. I've recently okay. like edged back into it and done a couple of PBTA-style games. Okay. But it's I have not played D&D in probably a decade. I'm super excited to play Dungeons & Dragons. Yeah. I, like, this is exciting to me. I love teaching people to play, so this is awesome. So we've been talking for a few weeks about your character. Yeah. Tell me what you were looking at. Tell me how you were feeling about it. I was looking at a couple of different kinds of characters, and I always like to play sort of hybrid characters, people who are caught between races, caught between sort of cultures and species. It, it's just part of my identity, so I always try to, try to bring it forward. Mm -hmm. So I was really interested in the uh, Genasi. They're half genie, half mortal, mm -hmm. and they're sort of elemental kinds of creatures yes. uh, tied to the nature tied to the land, and that struck me as something that would be really interesting to play. Because also, you know, everyone's heard of elves and right. dwarves and trolls or whatever, and this was like, I did not know this was a possibility. Right. Uh, it's, I mean, it's a relatively new playable race in the game, yeah. and they're also very rare in the world. Oh, okay. So, cool. so not only, you know, you kind of, like you were talking about that caught between two worlds thing, being, yeah. you know, a mortal version of a genie, essentially. Right. But you're also a little bit alone in the world. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. yeah. It'd be sad and interesting, but, yeah. you know, hopefully I'll have a, a good crew with me, and I thought, you know, having something that, that singular might be really fun for this. Yeah, and so you yeah. chose, uh, and which flavor of Genasi did you choose? Uh, I chose an Earth Genasi, okay. so tied to rocks. I think the name that I went with was Igneous. Yes, and I have that character here. So this is the oh, great. beginning skeleton of the character that we yes. put together. This is your first level character skeleton. And, you know, we've got some basic things at the top, and what class did you choose? Druid. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about your connection to the earth and to nature yes. and things that started to feel weird, but also we spend a lot of time thinking about what does that mean? We're going to be in a city adventure. We're playing in a version of Greyhawk. Greyhawk right. is the first Dungeons and Dragons published world, okay. and it's the one I played in when I was twelve. Started when I was twelve, and so this is my living Greyhawk. This is the same world I've been playing in since I was twelve. Wow. All of the events of all of the adventures that I ran and played in as a child are all part of this timeline. So the, this version of Greyhawk looks very different from the one that you would pick up in a published book now. <laughs> right. But this is the world we're playing in, and we're playing in a big city called the Free City of Greyhawk. And the center of the world essentially is this King's Landing style quarter of a million people jammed between these big walls city. Oh, wow. And you find yourself as a Genasi Druid in this place. Like, exactly. Yeah, we were talking about that and talking about, you know, it's one of the reasons I went with an Earth Genie mm -hmm. or an Earth Genasi because of the tie to the sort of the land itself, the bedrock mm -hmm. underneath a city. You know, mm -hmm. I grew up in New York, and so that's a big city of a lot of concrete, but a lot of it is sort of dredged up from what's beneath it. It's all, and it all sort of blends together into this one sort of mass and I was thinking about a city that it's the rocks are pulled from the bedrock beneath and sure. feeling that tie to this place yeah this particular place not just sort of like generalized rocks but these rocks are my rocks yeah I, I, that's that's really cool like I, this is an exciting character for me the yeah. idea of the druid in the city these layers of sort of isolation but connection at the same time yeah Super and the connection cool. to all the creatures and all of the sort of parts of a city you know the parklands the alleyways the sewer and the, the subterranean tunnels and the crypts and whatever else is in there, just so feeling cool. feeling all of that to sort of flow through me. Okay, so that's yeah. that's awesome. So this is part of the story. This is the beginnings of who you are as yeah. a character. So let's talk about some of the mechanical things that go into this. So we sure. said before, this is your character sheet. Basic stuff at the top, this is who you are. You're the name that you chose. You're a druid. Your background is hermit, which is something right. that we talked about. Yep. Um, even though you're in a city, you were isolated. Yeah, so that sense that's, of separation. Makes sense. Some background information there, again, based upon what we had talked about. Mm -hmm. You've got your ability scores here. These are sort of your physical abilities, strength, dexterity and constitution, intelligence, wisdom, charisma. You rolled those when you yep. rolled the dice. Hit points, skills right here. We'll get into all this stuff when we start to play the game, but this is the framework of your character. You've got yeah. a couple of specific powers that you have because you're Genasi. You have this thing called Earthwalk that allows you to move through difficult terrain. Even like As long as it's earth and terrain, earth and stone, right. you move through it just like you're normally walking. It's really cool. You also have this thing called Merge with Stone. So once a day you're able to pass without trace. There's a spell called Pass Without Trace that lets yeah. you to just move without, without anybody seeing you, without anything happening, without anybody detecting you. So right. that's part of your Genasi powers. You also have Druid spells, of course. Awesome. Possible. And we'll yep. talk a little bit about spells today, but mostly this is going to be our homework and the next week is going to be to pick our spells. Cool. Okay. And then over here you've got weapon proficiencies and some armor. Druids, they don't have much in the way of armor or weapons. Yeah. And then languages. You speak Elvish and Druidic and Common. 
and then primordial, primordial. which is the language of the genies and stuff. Oh, so, and this weird. is all basic first level druid earth genasi stuff, yeah. as, as basic as that can be. <laughs> so let's talk about the world that you're in and living in the city. When we talked together, we talked mm -hmm. about sort of like being in the parks and connected to the earth. So yeah. mechanically speaking, you spend your first while in the city studying your druid stuff. Right. Learning, learning the spells, learning, and learning more about who I am. I mean, right. as a, a fairly singular being in this world, it's not like... I've got a whole community that can say like, these are the rules and this is right. how it works. It was a lot of internal study, a lot of a, a lot of hermitage, yeah. basically. Yeah. I imagine that you know there's not exactly a crypt, but some sort of underground room, maybe an old cave that's mm. part of the oldest foundations of the city sure. that I sort of claimed as my own space. I and think about like the catacombs below a lot of the big European yeah. cities, right? Where the city's built on top of it, but these spaces remain. Exactly, and okay. there, there are those sort of rough hewn sort of cave-like spaces underneath a city. Okay. And I figure that's that's where I've spent most of my time and okay. most of certainly most of my sort of formative years. So let's talk about these first few levels of character, uh, mm -hmm. mechanically, the first few levels as you're living this hermitage and finding out who you are. So you've got your level one character, yep. so now we'll move to level two. So the first thing that we do when we get a new level is we roll hit points. Okay. Um, now in the game you can roll hit points or you can just choose hit points. You have a d8 as your hit dice, okay. so that's uh, this guy. In the game you can choose to take a five instead of rolling the dice. I like to roll the dice, yeah. I like to make my players roll the dice, so we're gonna roll for those hit points. Excellent. So we're starting with eight, you're gonna roll. So four, it becomes 12 hit points. Great. And then we're gonna look to the book here, this is our player's mm -hmm. handbook, mm -hmm. and uh, the player's handbook's laid out so that you can mechanically move through the levels pretty easily. The story comes from us and the characters come from right. our brains, but this is the mechanical stuff just laid out in this nice table here. So the big things that you get at second level is you get Wild Shape and Druid Circle. So these are some big choices. Ooh. So first let's talk about Wild Shape, because there's nothing to choose in Wild Shape. What Wild Shape does is at second level, you can use your action, and we'll talk about actions and stuff when we get together to play, right. to assume the shape of a beast you have seen before. Oh, that's great. Now, at first level, you can't assume the shape of a very powerful beast. You can't say, you know, I'm going to be a dinosaur or something, oh, right? right? <laughs> So it's just basically regular beasts, and you can't assume the shape of anything that flies, or if you do, you can't fly while you're doing Got it. it. But basically, this is gonna allow you to take a beast shape. Um, and you can do this twice, and you, you regain that after a short or long rest. Okay. So you'll be able to write, do beast shape. So I would just write wild shape, and your power's there. And powers. Yep. Awesome. Great, so that's, all, all druids have this, and this is the power you'll be able to yeah. use. The other thing that you get to choose is a druid circle. Now a druid circle dictates sort of the kind of path that you're going to be on mm. as a druid. There are a whole bunch of circles to choose from, but based upon our conversations, I found two that I think worked really well for sort of being in the city and sort of the background that we looked at. Cool. The first one's in the player's handbook and it's called Circle of the Moon. This is a lot more about embracing your transformation and embracing your yeah. connection with the, in this case, the animals in right. the city. The, rats and raccoons and mice and crows and yeah. owls and all of those things, uh, alligators in the sewers, all this kind of stuff, really leaning into that. The other one's here in the Xanathar's Guide, and this is the Circle of the Shepherd. And this one also sort of leans into the beasts and creatures of the mm -hmm. place where you live, but this would be more about working with them and communicating with them and kind of communing and and being allies with the with the beasts yeah. of the city. Do either of those appeal to you? I feel like the Circle of the Shepherd fits more of how I've been thinking about Igneous as sort of taking on the the role of protector of the city. Of that nature guardian that's in of the city. The city. Yeah. And that's and the nature in the city needs a guardian. Right? Exactly. Because, yeah. yeah. Things are encroaching, humans are encroaching, it's the space that a wild thing has is getting smaller and sure. they need someone to protect them. That's wonderful. So we'll do Circle of the Shepherd. So mm -hmm. underneath the powers of the right, Circle of the Shepherd. And then you get two powers that go along with that circle. So the first one is you get the ability to converse with beasts and mm -hmm. fey. Cool. So you add to your languages over here. You speak Sylvan, just add uh, Sylvan to your languages. You read cool. and write Sylvan. And when you speak with beasts, most animals don't have like long conversations to have <laughs> right. with you. But you can ask them simple questions, you can find out where they've been recently, maybe what they saw or heard very recently, they don't have long memories, but right. you really literally can talk with these animals and, and ask them questions. Mm -hmm. The other thing is you get a spirit totem. And this is where you can call forth a natural influence from what's around you. You have a spirit, the spirit comes in and it can help you. It persists for a minute, and with that feature, depending upon the spirit you choose, mm -hmm. you get some different things that you can do. So you get the bear spirit. It grants you and your allies its might and endurance. You have a hawk spirit, which is a consummate hunter, so it aids you with sight. 
you've got the unicorn spirit, which is a spirit of protection to those nearby. Hmm. And so any of those three, do any of those feel like they... I feel like the hawk spirit. I think and, feels right. and I think we might even for the flavor of the game because you are in the city maybe that's the yeah. spirit of the crow or yeah. the raven. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So let's do that. So it's called spirit totem, raven spirit. And essentially it's keen sight and insight is going to allow you to be a little bit better in certain attacks during the day. And we'll again deal with that mechanically when we play. Excellent. All right. So that's the second level. So a lot of things happen for a druid at the second level as you learn your path. And this is sort of when you're seeking enlightenment in the sewers and stuff. And let's yeah. do level three as well. So mechanically, you will have made these big choices and leaned into them before you move out to more emergence with the world. So level three is pretty straightforward. So level three is hit points, always. So we roll okay. that hit dice. That's right. Hit dice. All right, so we're going to add five to that. So you go from five. 12 to 17. And then, you know, you're going to get more spells. We'll talk about spells again at the end, and we'll have yeah. some homework about spells. But the other thing that happens to you as you get ready to merge from the city, so you're in contemplation, you've grown in power, you yeah. understand yourself a little better, and you become this protector of animals and need to move out and move about the city a little bit more. The last thing before you sort of, you still live in the catacombs, but before you spend more time with the rest of the people, is you discover deep in the catacombs in this search for yourself a staff. Oh, a magical cool. staff. Nice. It's called the Staff of Flowers. So I would write that under your gear here. Gear. Staff, staff of Flowers. Staff of Flowers. And this isn't an incredibly powerful magical item, but it's a yeah. precious one. Okay. Um, what the Staff of Flowers does is it has 10 charges, and if you strike the Staff of Flowers on any patch of earth anywhere, no matter how large or small, yeah. you grow a flower. Oh. Uh, and it just allows you to bring that, that nature to other places in the city. Oh, that's nice. So, yeah. so you uh, find the Staff of Flowers, you sort of find yourself in this place. Yeah. Um, so then as you're emerging more into the city and spending a little more time with the surface, trying to interact with more peoples, you encounter a, a group of people in the city. And you've seen the city watch before, obviously, moving yeah. about through the city. But you become known as a friend of the animals and a friend of the nature in the city. Yeah. Uh, and you're asked by an investigator to help uh, solve a crime, this is a, a murder, oh. um, in one of the small parks in the okay. Free City. So they reach out to you because they know you spend time there, and this person is a member of the Inquisitors. Yeah. And you know that the City Watch has three sections. There's the, the, the Crimson Cloaks, which are the basic City Watch. Um, there's the Griffin Guard, which are like the elite strike force, the SWAT okay. team. And then there's the Inquisitors, and they're the detectives. They investigate especially magical crime. And so they come to you as sort of a beginning to become known as a protector of these open spaces Correct. of the city. Um, to help them solve this crime. You work with them a little bit. And over the course of that working with them, they invite you to join them. Oh, so this cool. is a place where you have to decide, do I stay where I am as the hermit or do I join? Do I join? I feel like at this point for my character, the best way to, to help protect the city is to be out and to be connected with the people. Even though that's not like a natural thing for you, you're, you're a hermit, you're yes. a loner, you're an outsider. Yes, I feel like after all this time and the sort of internal study, uh, even as an outsider, I realize there's a limit to what I can do mm -hmm. on my own. So this is going to be an ongoing challenge for you on top of being an outsider as yeah. a Genasi, on top of being a, a druid trying to protect nature in the city. You now are working with a team potentially. Right. Maybe not all the time, sometimes by yourself. Yeah. Um, but working with a team as well. So this is another layer. It'll be of... another layer, another sort of thing to navigate my sort of hermit tendencies. And when when do I retreat? Yeah. When do I need to, to pull back from all of that? The stuff uh, of good stories. Exactly. Yeah, awesome. Okay, cool. So let's do some mechanical work then. So this yep. is level four. In level four, there's not much that happens from a mechanical standpoint for your character. You get more hit points, obviously. All right. Six. So that's, yeah, you roll the six there, so you're going to add that six. And then at level four, your wild shape improves. And again, this is for all druids, this is just what happens to you. But you can be slightly more powerful creatures. You still can't fly, but you could, for instance, be, to use the example of crocodile in here. We talked about the alligators in oh, the sewers yeah. a little bit. So That'd be great. that becomes something you can change into a crocodile or creatures of that ilk, maybe a coyote or something. Okay. You know, those things that roam the streets. So yeah. a little bit more powerful. So your wild shape is there, and, we'll, and we've already understand what that is. Mm -hmm. And then everybody who reaches fourth level in a character class gets an ability score improvement. And what this means is just as you've grown as a person, so too have your abilities, mm -hmm. your physical or mental abilities. And you get two points that you can use two points on one ability or spread them between different abilities. Your wisdom is your primary most important ability as a druid. Yeah. It's where your spells come from. You've already got a 16 in wisdom, so it's pretty high already. Yeah. But you could improve that if you wanted to, or you could look to one of your other abilities and say, you know what, I'm going to juice this one a little bit or that one or, or multiples. Now, 
interestingly, mechanically, this is just pure mechanics right here, mm -hmm. all of your abilities are even numbers. Yeah. So adding one to one of these abilities, the ability score bumps, the bonus bumps happen at even numbers okay. in Dungeons and & Dragons. So adding one point to any of these doesn't help you mechanically. It could help you flavor-wise, you're growing, right. but it's not going to help you mechanically. So really, the, the mechanical smart thing to do would be to add two points add to, two one to, of them two to one of and them and bump one of them. The other thing that you can do at this point is we could choose a feat instead. It's a cool thing that your character can do. Mm. It's an alternate rule, but we're going to stick to the straight and narrow when we learn this yeah. game, so ability scores. That makes sense to me. I'm going to add two to intelligence. Okay. After all of this study and after connecting and looking both inward and outward, I've, I've picked up some more insights. Great. So your intelligence moves from 10 to 12, and your mm -hmm. bonus moves from 0 to 1, plus 1. And this is the time when you're invited to the Inquisitors, you're helping them solve this murder in the yeah. park, you're becoming closer to them, you're still, we try and find time to retreat, you still live in these catacombs, right. but, but you're working more with a team. As you move into level 5, you become a more important part of this, and in fact in level 5 you're going to be invited to join an elite squad of of Inquisitors and be okay. part of this permanent team. And again, still having the time to yourself, still being right. able to retreat, be part of an, a permanent team. So right. let's do quickly the mechanics of this. There isn't a whole lot here. You're going to do hit points again. Alright. Oh, you rolled an 8. Perfect. <laughs> right. Best you could do. So you move from 23 to 31 hit points. So that's where we'll stay for when we play, mm -hmm. when we get back together. The other big thing that happens at level 5 is you get a bunch of extra spells, and again, we'll do spells in a moment. All right. But as you become part of this elite force, uh, mm. as you work with the Inquisitors following these crimes and solving these things, there are magical items and stuff that occasionally get found, and those become part of the City Watch's cash. They're meted out to people as they need them, but you do get an important magical item at this point. And if you want to write this under gear, you get a Cape of the Mountebank. Cape of the Mountebank. So yep. with the Cape of the Mountebank, yep. once per day, you can cast Dimension Door, and the way it manifests with the Cape of the Mountie Bank is there's a flash of brimstone, a little bit like Nightcrawler. <laughs> yes. Flash of brimstone, <laughs> smell of brimstone, yeah. and you step through a door, and you can go 400 feet uh, oh, in wow. any direction, uh, as long as you know what's on the other side. Okay. Um, so you can do that once per day, that teleportation. Oh, cool. Um, so that, that, is, that is given to you by the Inquisitors as part of your official joining of awesome. the Inquisitors. Now the last thing that I want to do here from a mechanic standpoint is talk about spells. So you've got a spell sheet, the third sheet in this stack here is spells, the second sheet is flavor stuff for your character, mm -hmm. and the third sheet is spells. So as a druid, we talked about this, your spells are wisdom based. Wisdom right. is your primary ability. So we're going to fill in this top part of the spell sheet here. You've got your uh, spell casting class, right. that's druid, druid, you're a druid, you have druid spells. Mm -hmm. And here you've got your spell casting ability, which is wisdom when you're a druid. Um, so you just write wisdom right in there. Them. And then there's two important numbers that go along with your spell casting, and they are right here. This is a spell save DC and a spell attack bonus. The spell save DC means when you cast a spell that somebody can resist against, you're trying to do something to them that they want to resist, yeah. they need a number to roll against, because D&D is a mechanical game, obviously. Right. So this spell save DC is that number. And the way we find that is it's 8, plus your wisdom modifier, and your wisdom modifier is 3, three. so it's 11, plus your proficiency bonus. Now your proficiency bonus is right here, and mm -hmm. you can write plus three there, because at level five you'll be plus three. We'll do all the rest of the math on our homework. Okay. So it's eight, plus three, eight. plus three. Plus three, so 14. So that's if somebody needs to save against one of your spells, it'll be a 14. Got it. The other thing is your spell attack bonus. And this is if you're doing an offensive spell that you need to roll to attack. Mm -hmm. This is your proficiency bonus again, plus your wisdom modifier. Plus the wisdom modifier, so six. So plus six right there, yep. So that's your bonus for that. Now, like I said, you're going to have a whole bunch of spells. Spells are your primary interaction with the world. You have divine spells, and right. you know, you've got your wild shape, and your spells are your big druid okay. things. So we'll spend some time this week talking and choosing those spells. There are so many to choose from. Got Doing it, it here would take us forever. <laughs> um, but we'll find some cool spells for you. The one thing I will say, is because you're a beginning player, is yeah. a lot of times beginning players will look to the spells and say which ones do the most damage, what are the most right. offensive spells, thinking about the combat nature of the game primarily. Dungeons and Dragons is more than a combat game. It, mm -hmm. Combat's an important part of it, obviously. But there's also a lot of interaction with other characters, interaction with the world, yeah. puzzle solving, you know, solving crimes because you're an inquisitor. Exactly. So when we're looking at spells, we're going to want to look at not just combat spells, but also like this wide range right. of things that you can potentially do. That's cool. Yeah, definitely thinking about it now, thinking about the things that you're going to need to solve crimes, to figure, to, to solve problems, to break 
through liars and things like that. It's and another really interesting thing that you have as a druid is you can heal people too. Yeah. So that's always an option too. So how do you want to focus those spells? Right. Cool. I'm super yeah. excited for this character. This <laughs> is be great. Uh, I really like all the challenges that Ignis has to to work through his isolation, his hermitage, his yeah. his uh, st uh, strange parentage. Let's say <laughs> exactly. um, all this is cool stuff, and I'm really excited to teach you how to play here, man. So. This is going to be really great. I'm really really stoked. Hey, hey. Hi, Dave. It's good to see you. You too. All right, let's uh, sit down here and talk about your character. All so. Right. We've been working for a couple of weeks on this character idea, mm -hmm. but one of the things that I learned about you when we first started talking is you haven't played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons, have you? I haven't played at all. I created one character, but I've never played. Okay. Well, I'm extremely honored to be able to take you through your first adventure. This is awesome. One of my favorite things is teaching new people to play, which is why we have Starter Kit. All right, so when we started talking about this character, you had a, an inspiration from World of Warcraft, right? Yes. I play a Blood Elf Hunter. That's okay. my main character. She's a little... She's not very leveled up, but oh, okay. <laughs> but I do enjoy uh, the bow and arrow. I enjoy yeah. the ranged weapons. So what did we decide to do with the character in Dungeons and Dragons? I decided to stay a little close to what I'm familiar with and go with a ranger. Mm -hmm. And I went half elf okay. because I know there's a lack of acceptance from the human world and the elf world. So yeah, it's one of the things we talked about too, right? You wanted to be sort of like a loner or... Yeah, a little bit of an outsider, somebody who doesn't quite fit in, hasn't mm -hmm. been accepted into either world. Right, right. And I thought that would be an interesting direction to take it in. And with choosing the ranger, you get the archery and all of the things that you're used to and that you like. Yes, yeah. and yeah. it also kind of leans into the fact that she can sort of uh, still stay on the outskirts, mm -hmm. but be involved if she needs to be. Absolutely, and can pass in both elfish and, and human society too. Mm -hmm. So that's great. So let's grab your character here. Uh, and what did you name her? I named her Shywin. Awesome. So we took everything that we talked about and you rolled some character abilities. Mm -hmm. And so we've got this all here, your first level character. We're gonna level her up to fifth level and talk about her as she moves sort of through the city into her life. Okay. So at first level, you've got your ability scores down here. You've got your proficiencies. This is where you know what weapons you can use and what languages you speak. Some background information about this sort of lone wolf stuff that we talked about, right? Mm -hmm. And a little bit of the powers that come with being a half elf you can see in the dark. You've got fey ancestry so that it's hard to charm you or to put you magically to sleep. And a couple of other things like that. So this is your first level character. Okay. And let's talk a little bit about the story as she moves through the world. So we're going to set this adventure in the world of Greyhawk, which is the world I started playing in 33 years ago. This is my living campaign of Greyhawk, so it's sort of different from maybe the published world because all the characters and adventures I've played in my last 33 years are, have affected this world. Oh. And we're playing in a city called the Free City of Greyhawk, this massive city in the center of the world. It's about 250,000 people in this city, and this is where you live. Now, one of the things that we talked about with being a ranger is that typically they're thought of as forest dwellers, mm -hmm. right? So a ranger in a city is an interesting idea. So tell me about how you think about the how your character moves through this world. I think that living on the edge of two different societies that don't necessarily accept, because that is correct, neither yeah. society really accepts the half-elves. Yeah. Being on the outskirts of that for a really long time but still witnessing injustices, I think she's kind of a champion for okay. for those who can't really champion themselves. Oh, awesome. So seeing these things from afar and kind of trying to affect maybe stepping in, and she's able to do that as a ranger mm -hmm. without really getting closely involved with people, maybe at a certain point she decides that she needs to take a more active role. Okay, cool. And go into the city. And, and go join. into the city. Join the City Watch. Yes. Okay, cool. And so she'll rise up the ranks of the City Watch. Um, she starts as like a beat cop, a regular crimson cloak, rises up those ranks. So we're going to start leveling you up as we go here through the story. So the first thing that we do is move to level one, level two. Mm -hmm. The first thing that we're going to do is roll hit points. And we're going to do this a bunch because every time you level up, you become more resilient. You can take more damage, you can fight for longer, and that's your hit points. Okay. So. You're a ranger, so you have a d10 for your hit points. That means every time you roll, you can roll anywhere from 1 to 10. And now you could just take a 6 and add your constitution bonus to it. That's a perfectly fine rule. That's part of what we do here in the book. But I like to roll dice, and yeah. I think that's super fun. So that's we're going to. point, right? Exactly, I think so. So let's roll this and see what we get. I'm nervous, though, because I'm not necessarily the best at rolling. Well, so. it's not gambling, we'll it's see. just, uh, yeah. 
<laughs> oh, and a 10 right off the gate. Yeah, you're terrible okay. at it, clearly. Um, so you would take that 10 and add your constitution bonus. Your constitution is 10. You've got no bonus there, so it's just the die roll. So you add 10. Okay. So you're going to add 10 to your uh, hit point score right there in the middle of your sheet. Okay. So that becomes 20, just like that. Awesome. So that's the first thing that happens when you gain level 2. The next thing, and this is handy because in the book here, this is the player's handbook, and your ranger section right here has a nice little table that tells us all the things that happen as you move mechanically through the book. So the story comes from you, comes from inside our hearts, mm -hmm. and the mechanical stuff comes from this table and it's laid out really well in the book here. Okay. So the next thing that happens when you reach level two is you pick a fighting style as a ranger. Okay. Now, you've talked about the weapon that you like to use in World of Warcraft, right? Bow and arrow. Yeah, absolutely. So in the fighting styles, you have a handful of different things, but one of them, the first one we see here is archery. Oh, I think that's perfect. So that seems like the right thing for you, yeah. right? So in your powers over here on the right, let's write fighting style, okay. archery. And what that will mean is when it comes time to do all the math of the character, which will be part of our homework after today, you're going to add a plus two bonus whenever you attack with ranged weapons. Okay. So with your bow, you'll get an extra bonus to roll to hit somebody. Great. So that's awesome. That's your base fighting style right there. The other thing that happens for a ranger at level two is you start to get spells. Um, not the same way like a wizard would or a cleric. So you're not going to get a huge panoply of spells to work with, but you will get ranger spells. Okay. So we're going to talk some more about spell casting at the end of what we're doing here, but just knowing at second level you gain some spells and you're going to know a handful of spells, and they're based upon your wisdom. Your wisdom uh, as a ranger is how you access sort of the natural world, okay. and that's where your magic comes from, the natural world. Great. So this time is when you join the City Watch, sort of first and second level ranger is when you're being recruited, you're doing your training, and you join the City Watch, you join the Crimson Cloaks. And I think b because you're talking a little bit about being an outsider, I think maybe you're not as accepted by your group as maybe you would like, and the kind of the beat cops part of the City Watch doesn't feel maybe like the perfect place for you. Right. However, because you are an archer, you've chosen the archery specialty, you're, also, you're very um, useful to them. They use you as a sniper um, and as a guard on roofs and stuff, and you become very necessary to their work, even though maybe you don't like it as much. Right. So let's move from level two then to level three mechanically, and then talk about what happens to you in the story there. So the first thing again with level three is you're gonna add some hit points. So let's roll those hit points again. Four. That's not bad. So you okay. add four more. So we get 24 there. And this is where, as a ranger, you start to find out who you are. You add a thing called an archetype, mechanically called an archetype. You kind of figure out who you are, differentiates you from other different kinds of rangers. And there are a bunch of archetypes in the Player's Handbook. Mm -hmm. There's also some in the Xanathar's Guide, which we're going to look at. But there is one ranger archetype in particular that I wanted to show you and see what you think. Okay. Because you're working in a city, there's a ranger archetype called the Gloom Stalker. And in the first paragraph here, if you read that first paragraph for me. Gloom Stalkers are at home in the darkest places, deep under the earth, in gloomy alleyways, in primeval forests, and wherever else the light dims. So to me, that gloomy alleyways spoke of, you know, the seedier parts mm -hmm. of the city. So Gloom Stalkers, that's their whole deal, is they, they sit in the shadows. If you were a sniper for the City Watch before, you start to be that reliable person that can sneak into the places that maybe other people wouldn't be able to go, you know, pass in those dark alleyways, find out what's going on in the seedier parts of the city. That's exactly as I saw her. Okay, perfect. So that's perfect. Great. That's great. So we'll be a, a gloom stalker then as your archetype. So in your powers there, I want you to write archetype, gloom stalker. Gloom stalker. It just sounds cool too, right? It really yeah. does. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And then you get two things being a gloom stalker. You get some more magic stuff, and again, we'll talk about the magic at the end, okay. but you get Dread Ambusher is one of the things you get, so it, which sounds cool, right? So write Dread Ambusher there in your powers. And what this is, is you're a, you're a master of ambushing people. In the game, and we'll find out this when we play together, you roll initiative to start combat to see what order people act in. Okay. You're going to get bonuses to your initiative. Uh, you'll be among the first to act all the time. You're just a master of that moment of the ambush. Great. Okay. The other big power that you get when you become a Gloom Stalker is something called Umbral Sight. Now, what this allows a person to do is to see in the dark. Now, you're already a half elf, so you have dark vision up to 60 feet. However, because this is a, this knows that you might already be somebody who has dark vision, you get to add 30 feet to your dark vision. Ooh. Yeah, so you can see further in the dark than a normal half elf. So you've got your dark vision already up here. If you just add that to 90 feet now. Great. 
And then the last thing that you get at third level, there's this three basic powers that you get third level as a ranger, is something called primeval awareness. And this is back in the player's handbook again. You write that in your powers. And with primeval awareness, this allows you to focus your mind and you can sense the presence of undead or dragons or demons or fiends within about a one mile radius of you. Oh, that's awesome. So you can just sort of quiet yourself and sense all that stuff. Okay. So all of this happens at third level. Third level is sort of a big turning point for you. You kind of come into your own as a ranger. Yeah. I think this is probably also the moment, based upon us talking about your trajectory of your character, where you become really disenchanted with being a beat cop, essentially. Right. So do you have any thoughts about how that might occur? Like, what, what makes you feel like this is not your path? So a few things probably happened. Being a beat cop, you only have so much control. Once you take the bad guys in, you don't have much control over what happens to them. Mm -hmm. uh, being on the outside of society, obviously her charisma's a little low. Uh, taking orders has been an issue for her. Mm -hmm. And if she isn't seeing like what got her into this job to begin with, if she isn't seeing the change that she thinks is necessary, mm -hmm. then she becomes very disenchanted okay. with her situation. There's always the need and the desire to have more of an effect mm -hmm. on the on the world around her. Okay, that makes sense. Especially if she's a champion for those who can't really fight for themselves. I I was thinking she kind of grew up on the streets. Okay. Not being accepted uh, yeah. again by either society, maybe more of a an urchin type. Yeah, sure. And if she has been used to working outside of the confines of society, being inside the confines of this particular job. That makes total sense, it makes total sense. It's too much for her. So at this point, you know, around third level, her, she comes into her powers, she's disenchanted for all these reasons that we talked about, so she starts to seek other outlets. The city watch still makes sense. You're still seeking that kind of protection and order and stuff, sure. but looking for other avenues inside there. So your two options are the Griffin Guard, which are sort of an elite SWAT team kind of unit, or the Inquisitors. And the Inquisitors are, they investigate magical crimes and they go deep into like the thieves quarter and stuff and take care of these really horrible, horrible crimes and try to investigate them and bring them to justice. And both groups would definitely recruit you. You're a powerful sharpshooter and archer. You're super useful to both groups. But I feel like, based on what you described, the Griffin Guard's gonna be more of the same. It's even though you're more powerful, you're gonna be taking orders and doing That's more of the same. That's kind of what I was thinking too, yeah. yeah. But the Inquisitors. This is where you're, yeah, where you're getting to the real root of the problem. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's what she wants to do. So as part of this, so she applies into the Inquisitors, uh, is accepted into that group and moves into those ranks of the City Watch. Part of this is she's gonna be doing a lot more kind of undercover kind of work. So she's granted a magical item. And this magical item. I was gonna ask if there was undercover work. <laughs> there's, one, there's totally undercover work. Yay. And this is a suit of studded leather armor that is called Armor of Glamour. Mm. So if you write that in your equipment right here, Armor of Glamour. Totally up my alley. And so what this does is it's studded leather armor, it's studded leather plus one, so even more powerful than normal studded leather, but at your will, it can turn into looking just like regular clothing. Oh. So despite the fact you're always wearing armor, you appear, if you want to, whenever you want to, to be wearing regular clothing. That's awesome. Yeah, it is, it's super cool. So yeah, so that's part of your undercover work as we move into uh, level three and move into the Inquisitors. So as we spend some time in the Inquisitors, we're gonna to move to level four. We'll do the mechanical work here for level four. Okay. Level four is again, more hit points. So you've got your D10. That's oh. a nine, plus Ooh. your constitution zero, so nine more. You're killing it with the resilience. You can take a lot of hits, stand in the, stand and trade blows Yay. to 33. The other big thing that happens at level four, and this happens to all uh, character classes at level four when you reach level four, mm -hmm. is that you get an ability score bonus. Now, we can do ability core score bonus or there's an alternate rule for picking feet as well. We're gonna stick to the straight and narrow and do the ability score bonus. Okay. So you get two points, you can add them both to one ability score or you can add one to two different ability scores. So if we look at your sheet here, you're doing pretty well for your dexterity. You've got an incredibly high dexterity of 20. Mm -hmm. So as, for your, as far as your archery goes, you're taking care of all of it. Your wisdom's okay, you've got a plus one in wisdom, and that's where your spells come from. But you're a little lower in some other areas. 
it seems to me, and this is sort of the idea of this ability bonus, is that you've trained, you've done a bunch of stuff, and you've raised one of your abilities. So where do you think you might like to increase your abilities? Well, wisdom is probably a good idea, but also, and, and let me know what you think about this. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, especially if she's been in the city for a little while now and she's going undercover, charisma probably should go up a little bit. It's not the worst thing in the world. Right now your charisma is nine, so you've got a minus one on those kinds of interactions. So raising it to 10 is gonna put that penalty at zero, so mm -hmm. that's definitely gonna help in that respect. So okay. I think that's a solid choice too. Great. So let's, okay, uh, so... let's just change that nine to a 10. And then the minus one becomes a zero. Aha. Go away, minus one. And then you have one more point to spend somewhere else. Now, I'll tell you mechanically, so we're kind of metagaming here. Metagaming is when you use the rules instead of thinking about your character as much. Mm -hmm. Mechanically speaking, the bonuses to your ability scores happen at even numbers. So 10 and 11 have the same bonus plus zero. So you wouldn't raise this guy to an 11. It's not going to help you with anything mechanically. Right. However, you do have a couple of scores that are all on odd numbers. You've got two 13s in intelligence and wisdom, and you have an 11 in strength. So any of those are gonna give you another bonus if you add one to them. Mm -hmm. Again, your dexterity is so super high right now that doesn't seem to be a place where you'd want to right. really bump up. I mean, <clears throat> I'm thinking if it's since it's more detective work, I think mm -hmm. either wisdom or intelligence might be better. Those seem solid. Wisdom is your spell casting ability as well. So as you cast spells as a ranger, bumping up that wisdom is gonna help those spells too. Let's do wisdom. Alrighty. Yeah. That sounds perfect. So that becomes a 14, and that's a plus two now Ooh. to your wisdom. All right, and so th I think this is the place. So you become kind of come into your own here, right? You're kind of moving through the Inquisitors. This, you get to spend some time alone as the lone wolf that you are doing investigations, going undercover, really making a difference in the city, solving, solving these crimes rather than just going out and busting heads. Right. I think this is where you probably get recruited into one of the elite squads, which is what we're going to play with when we're out there at the day. So you get recruited in that elite squad. Okay. And then you also raise yourself to level five. So this is kind of the last mechanical piece that we'll do here is rising to level five. Now in level five, you'll roll more hit points, exactly. <laughs> so let's do those guys. Uh, oh, oh. So it's actually important. So you rolled a one. I did. So because I make my players roll hit points when they could just take that six, I don't, if they roll a one on their first roll, I let them re-roll. Now if you roll a one again, you're gonna have to keep it. But I want you to be able to stand toe to toe with the bad guys. We're right. playing a fun game here. So let's re-roll that. Okay. That hit point, hit die. All right, so a six, much better than a one. Great. You don't have any bonuses for your constitution, so you'll just add six to there. So we're up to 39 now, yeah? All right. Excellent. So hit points are the first thing that happens to you in level five, but the big thing for you as a warrior and as a martial character, as a character who kind of mixes it up and attacks and does a lot of damage, is that at level five, you get an extra attack. Oh. So I would write that in your powers here, extra attack. So. When you take the attack action, and we'll explain this when we play the game, mm -hmm. you get to take two attacks instead of one. So with your bow, you're gonna be up on the roof there firing those arrows I'm away. kind of badass. It's totally badass, right? right? Yeah, so you're stalking in the darkness, you're jumping out and ambushing people, you're firing arrows all over the place. You get a little like Legolas, but not in the sunlight, in the shadows, I right? I like this. Yeah, no, it's gonna be super, super cool. So that's your big thing at level five mechanically. Okay. So that's, the, that's mostly what we've got on your character sheet here. We've got your, your special armor, all of your powers and abilities. Mm -hmm. I wanna move to the spell casting side now. Okay. So there's a little bit of mechanical work we need to do for spell casting. So that your spell sheet is the last sheet in that stack there. there and as a ranger, you cast spells as we were talking about with wisdom as your primary ability. Mm -hmm. So first, uh, your class of spell casting, you're a ranger, so that goes right there. And then we just said your spell casting ability is wisdom. And your wisdom is gonna determine how powerful your spells are, how much people are able to avoid them, those kinds of things. So there's two things that go along with that. And the first thing there, and this is right here in the book, is your spell save DC. Now what that's gonna mean, and we'll see this mechanically when we play the game, is mm -hmm. that some of the spells that you cast, people can try to resist those spells. Right. And so that you need a number, they need a number to roll against to see if they can resist it, how powerful your spell is. So that's eight. Okay. Plus your proficiency bonus. Let's put plus three right here where proficiency bonus is. Your th fifth level character is okay. so your plus three proficiency. So it's eight plus your proficiency bonus plus your wisdom modifier. Eleven and this plus guy? Plus two now, yeah. So, so it's now 13. plus two. So thirteen. Thirteen it is. So your spell save DC is thirteen. Aha. And the other one is your spell attack bonus. So many of your spells may be offensive spells, shooting blasts and things like that. Right. So your spell attack bonus is your proficiency bonus. Okay. Plus your ability bonus there. So that's three plus two, 
plus five then again there. <laughs> all right. It's all role playing games are is let's so empathy and math. That's right. all role playing games. <laughs> um, so that's that's your spell stuff. We're gonna pick spells as homework outside of here because there's so many spells to choose from, and we'll have okay. probably long conversations about what spells you want to use. But oh, I do yeah. want to talk about quickly as we pick spells. You want to think about who you are as a ranger. The first instinct a lot of time for new players is to pick combat spells, lots of spells that do damage. But your primary source of damage is going to be that bow. Mm -hmm. So as we think about spells here, we're going to want to think about spells that not only do damage, but also maybe help the other players or help you in some way or help in situations that aren't combat because you have some strong combat powers, right? Right. All right, so that's, that's all the mechanical stuff that we have to do for your character. So we're basically done here. We've got some homework. We're going to choose some spells and some other things in the coming week. How does this feel to you? How does this feel compared to the, the Blood Hunter that you were talk, talking about? I like that there's we're getting a little more in-depth. You know, you can't really melee and do uh, ranged weapons anymore mm -hmm. in WoW. So... This this is a little more well rounded. Oh, cool! And well, and that's one of the important things about a tabletop role playing game versus uh, like a, an MMO like WoW is that you've got some pretty tight boundaries in those games. You can explore a huge, expansive world, right? right? But you can only do the things that the rules allow you to do. In this game, you can do anything that you want. You tell me what you want to do, and I'm going to help you figure out how to do that. So yeah, that's we're the fully fleshing her out, which is great. If you want more details about these characters or to see them in action in a fantasy detective story. Join us for Starter Kit, only on Alpha.